Hey, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. My name is Christy Norris. I'm the director of Carolina K-12 at UNC Chapel Hill. My colleague Paul Benici is with us behind the scenes if you need any technical assistance while you are with us this evening. So we are just thrilled to be here with you this evening along with our partners at the North Carolina Museum of History and the North Carolinianus Society. And we do not take lightly your level of Zoom fatigue and just life fatigue in general. Um, so many aspects of our days continue to be through a computer screen. And for those of you back in the classroom live, we know it's exhausting and stressful with the added layers of health concern. So let me again say to all of the K-12 teachers with us on behalf of Carolina K-12 and the Museum of History and the North Carolinianus Society, Thank you, thank you for your service. You have faced an unimaginable situation in your classrooms this past year, and we want you to know that we value and appreciate you and are really here to support you in whatever way that we can. So thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, our mission at Carolina K-12 is to serve our state's hardworking teachers with free high quality professional development, continuing education programs. If you are new to us, Paul will pop in our web address and the chat for you. You can visit our site for upcoming programs. We have a database of resources just full of lesson plans and PowerPoints and all kinds of free resources to help you do the important work that you're doing in your classroom. Also, our co-hosts, the North Carolina Museum of History, have many resources and cool artifacts and um, lots of programs for teachers as well. So make sure that you check them out. It's all related to teaching North Carolina history. They are actually open in Raleigh for uh, visitation with safety precautions in place. If you're close enough to visit, great. But even if you're not like everyone, they have just um, some really rich online programming happening. So check them out as well. And we are, of course, incredibly grateful to the support of the Breitmayer Foundation in offering this event tonight, and also to our very own North Carolina Society here in the state, which is dedicated to the promotion and increased knowledge and appreciation of North Carolina's history and heritage. And Specifically, they understand the importance of facing all our history. And the society actually commissioned the book that we're going to be discussing in just a moment, Jim Crow in North Carolina by Richard Paschal. And uh, you'll meet him in just a bit. And they are going to be covering the cost of sending you your very own copy of the book after tonight. Uh, you have the choice of it or another really lovely book um, more suited for the actual classroom called Freedom's Children. And we're gonna tell you how to sign up for those at the end of tonight. So on to the topic of tonight. Uh, tonight we'll be examining Jim Crow, a system of racial apartheid in the American South that lasted officially for nearly a hundred years. It affected every part of Southern life, dictating everything from racial segregation to social etiquette, schools, restaurants, cemeteries, um, barely any part of life went untouched by Jim Crow. And while the system had many features and was really complex, its primary function was to promote and maintain a white supremacist racial order, both through the law, but also as we'll discuss the night in the specific ways the laws were imp implemented and practiced. And despite Jim Crow's prevalence, many of us today, especially our students, don't fully understand the complexity of this era. Um, many students think it was really just about a seat on the back of a bus or a separate water fountain. But in reality, the system was all encompassing, touching nearly every single part of Southern life for both black and white, as well as our indigenous populations and other people of color. And so tonight we'll be examining this history with the author of the new book, Jim Crow in North Carolina, as well as the ways people resisted Jim Crow in, a, in the performance of the musical, The Movement, coming to us from New York City's Leap Theater. We're really excited about that. So our intention tonight is to shine a light on this part of our shared history to help you learn more and to consider the various ways you can integrate this period of history and all that is connected to it, including current events. And uh, we really hope you will do this in your courses because this history is not so long ago and far away. You know, I recently saw a post on social media that noted that Anne Frank and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were both born in the same year in 1929. 
and were they still alive today as they should be, they would be turning 92 years old this year. So history is so close, we can touch it, but we have to start pulling the curtain back and facing it rather than burying it. And so that said, we know many of you find teaching our nation's hard history troubling or even risky in today's climate. Um, you know, it's been an especially charged political climate as of late. And we know some of you are facing unfair attacks from um, being biased or accused of having an agenda just for teaching your students the truth. Um, but the fact is to not acknowledge and teach about this history in hopeful and empowering ways but to not teach about it is to do ourselves and our students great harm. And we know it can be tricky. We're former teachers ourselves at Carolina K-12 and at the museum. And we know this looks very different based on who you are and where you're teaching and who you're teaching. But know that we are here to help with that. We'll be going over some teaching resources at the very end of this evening. And we'll be following up via email with lots of additional resources to help you teach about this period, both the injustice, but also the ways that many people, children themselves even, fought back against Jim Crow. And so as a final grounding of intention, I'll share one of my favorite quotes that Richard Pascal actually chose to open his book with, which is by the great W.E.B. Du Bois, who said, nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all this so far as the truth is ascertainable? And so with that, I'd like to invite Richard Pascal on to join me. Richard is an attorney at Schwartz and Shaw and has taught as an adjunct professor at the Wiggins School of Law of Campbell University. He spent an enormous amount of time recently researching and writing the book with which we are going to be talking about Jim Crow in North Carolina, the legislative program from 1865 to 1920. And we are just delighted to have him here with us. So hi, Richard, how are you? Christy, how are you? Good, good. Are you hanging in there? I see that you're in your office, so you're out and about a little bit. So. I am. We have we have certain protocols, but we're most of us are here in our office. Good, good. So you're not you firm, know, but yes, we're here in the office. You're not like me talking to your plants as your coworkers yet. So that that's good. Um, no, I'm, I'm doing that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to get us started um, with having you just take you know, 15 minutes or so and give us a little mini lecture, a whirlwind overview of this great, amazing, detailed book that you have written. And guys, you're, I mean, really, it's, this is just referenced and resourced and it's just, um, what a gift for, for the state and for really kind of facing history. But um, I think we would love to hear, you know, a lot of teachers have asked already why you chose these particular years, 1856 to 1920, um, and also what your key findings were. What do we, especially as teachers, most need to know and teach our students? So um, if it's good with you, I'm going to say goodbye for just a few minutes here and let you kind of give us your spiel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Pascal. I'm at Schwartz and Shaw a law firm here in Raleigh. Many of you are probably, uh, some of you at least, are probably aware of Schwartz and Shaw because we represent your school districts because we practice education law and represent school districts from Manio to Murphy, so to speak. So uh, moving forward, there's a cover of the book. Um, Christy asked how I came to write the book about this time period. I received a grant from the North Carolina Society. Uh, the grantor wanted uh, a study on the Jim Crow laws around 1900, and I just framed it from 1865 to 1920 because this was a big enough chunk to bite off, and uh, I had to get on with my life, and this was quite enough uh, to work on at one time. Someone else perhaps can do the 1921 forward version, but this, uh, this was a big enough piece to uh, bite off at one time. Uh, for those of you who uh, are looking at the cover of the book. The cover has on the top a uh, co uh, uh, cartoon that was run in the News and Observer. The News and Observer ran uh, these cartoons by Norman Jennett, 
who was from here in North Carolina, and they were fanning the flames of Negro domination. And you can't really see it in this small, but uh, there's a woman behind these bars. The uh, cartoon is entitled Behind the Bars, and there's a woman who is to represent Eastern North Carolina, who is supposedly trapped by Negro rule. And at the same time, uh, there's a picture at the bottom on the cover from 1914 around Southern Pines, which was more of the reality of what uh, uh, African-American life was at this time. So I often get a question uh, starting out, well, who was Jim Crow? Well, it, it came from someone named Thomas Dartmouth Daddy Rice, who was a white uh, performer who performed in minstrel shows. He performed in blackface and uh, hopped around in this character of Jim Crow uh, on stage with a, a limp and uh, started it in Louisville, but it became an international sensation, literally. I mean, on both sides of the Atlantic, he was performing uh, in London and other parts of Europe. And the refrain of the song, it was a multiverse song and people added verses all the time, but the central uh, refrain in the song, as you can see, was wheel about, turn about, do just so. And every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Some of the things people ought to know about Jim Crow segregation to start with, it's not a Southern phenomenon. One of the things is it started in the Northern states prior to the Civil War. That's because in the Northern states, more than in the Southern states, you would have had a sizable population of free Blacks. And so on streetcars in Boston and things like that, that was where the first Jim Crow cars appeared before the Civil War in the 1840s because of the popularity of this minstrel show put on by Daddy Rice. One of the other things about Jim Crow segregation is that it's not really a rural phenomenon. In small towns, people know one another and folkways and cultural norms and just a stare could enforce things like racial subordination but once you get to a city, and that's, that's where Jim Crow really has to start, in the cities, because people don't know one another. There is not the social pressure on a personal level that exists in small towns. Large towns have theaters. They have railroad stations. They have railroads. And so that is where Jim Crow started, really, both in the North and in the South after the Civil War. One thing I wanted to mention, I'm going to be flying pretty fast, but I wanted to touch on some things that would be of interest to the teachers. And one of the things I wanted to mention was something called the Dunning School of History. And it was by a teacher, a professor at Columbia University in New York named William Archibald Dunning, who had a fleet of graduate students who went across the country and taught at different universities and spread the gospel that Reconstruction was this awful period in American history. And one of the people who was one of his students was Joseph Hamilton, who the, until very recently, the history department building at Chapel Hill was named for. He became a professor at Chapel Hill. He started the Southern Historical Collection, but at the same time, <clears throat> he put forward a view and Dunning put forward a view of reconstruction, of misrule, of corruption, and. Uh, of these terms about scalawags and carpetbaggers that we often hear associated with this awful period of reconstruction, so to speak. And that was a viewpoint that corrupted uh, the textbooks of this country and was a, it was the way that reconstruction was taught for generations until really the middle of the 20th century that did you often even see the Dunning School viewpoint starting to recede. And it was because, as, as you see in the quote I have on uh, the page from Dunning, that the South was transformed into support of a social and political system in which all of the forces that made for civilization were dominated by a mass of barbarous freedmen. That was really the viewpoint about Reconstruction for a long time, and it's taken a lot of effort by a lot of scholars over the years to really change that viewpoint. Some of you may have read C. Van Woodward's The Strange Career of Jim Crow. It first came out in 1955 and went through several revisions. I read it as an undergraduate at Chapel Hill. Woodward was a historian of the South. And in this book, he made two principal arguments about history and really modern 
uh, American race history in some sense starts with this book. It was a revisionist book about what happened because in 1955, when the book came out, that is at the time of Brown versus Board of Education. There were a lot of people who thought racial segregation, well, this is always the way it's been. And Woodward went back to show that that's not the case, that Jim Crow discrimination had not always existed in the American South. During slavery, you don't need to have Jim Crow discrimination because often, you know, the, there were no free blacks to ride streetcars, railroads, and the like. And they, they weren't going to theaters except as accompanying their owners. But the second point that Woodward made was that in the years after the Civil War, there were forgotten alternatives, that there had been a fluidity in rela race relations that differed from the legal regime that Woodward saw as being imposed around 1900. So just to go over some of the details of post-Civil War history in North Carolina, the war stops in 1865. The, uh, there is first a period of what's called presidential reconstruction, but things change. That's the period of Andrew Johnson uh, creating a system for trying to reintegrate the Southern states into the Union. And but given what happened with Johnson, things and events quickly overtook him. And so we went, entered into a period of what's called congressional reconstruction. And that happened starting in March of 1867 with the passage of a statute by Congress that imposed uh, the true regime of military reconstruction that we think of when we think of that term. So in North Carolina, pursuant to that statute, pursuant to the fact that North Carolina was in the second military district and was under the command of uh, uh, US uh, generals, the military commander started to register the freedmen to vote in 1867. In North Carolina, there was a new state constitutional convention in 1868. That was a condition for readmission. It was a, also a condition to accept the 14th Amendment to be readmitted back to the Union. So once the state of North Carolina held a convention ratified a new constitution and uh, affirmed the 14th Amendment. Military reconstruction really ends in 1868 for North Carolina. It continues in the Deep South for many more years, but North Carolina uh, uh, got out of that and was readmitted to the Union earlier than some of the other states. Realize though that the Republicans maintained control of the state legislature until 1870 when the redeemers are elected to the General Assembly. The redeemers are called that from a white perspective because the Democrats redeemed white rule in the South. And so realize there are only really five years from 1865 to 1870 when the Republicans are in full control of the North Carolina legislature. But there were, were Republican governors even after 1870. And so full redemption doesn't come until Zebulon Vance, another Democrat, was elected governor in 1876. So some of the things that make North Carolina unique, Republicans maintained political strength in North Carolina in a way they didn't in virtually any other Southern state. The black vote was largely Republican, and I'm going to speak, be speaking of, of black and use the terms colored and Negro because some of these statutes are gonna be using those terms. I don't generally use African-American when talking in, when I'm in this history, because it's a little bit, African-American to me is a, a very modern term of, about uh, uh, current matters. And so to speak of statutes that in essence, defined what a Negro was. It seems to me to not uh, be, to be, uh, have some tension to speak of it as defining what an African American was with these laws that are about one drop rules and uh, having uh, one great grandparent who was white. So I will be speaking in those kind of terms and you should just be aware of that. But blacks were joined the party of Lincoln. They were mainly Republicans. And so in the majority black counties in the Eastern part of the state, Wayne, Wilson, that whole stretch, what was the black second congressional district 
that was a very strong Republican area. There was also a very strong Republican area in the western part of the state where many whites, there wasn't a plantation system of farms. The farms tended to be smaller. There weren't as many slaves in the western mountainous parts of the state. And the mountainous parts of the state remained to some degree unionist throughout the war. And so that was another stronghold. And so between those two power centers, Republicans maintained political viability throughout the 1800s all the way up to 1900 in North Carolina in a way they didn't in other states. In 1890s though, another party, third party grows and that's the Populist Party. The Populist Party was composed of mainly white farmers who had grown disenchanted with what the Democratic Party was doing, the Democratic Party and kind of a flip in the way we think about things. The Democratic Party was a supporter of corporate interest of banks at this time and they supported the railroads. And a lot of farmers were very unhappy with the way the Democrats had not allowed uh, for there to be a rate commission and to control the uh, uh, rates that farmers were shipping their goods on. And so that discontent with the Democrats turned into the Populist Party. And so what happens in 1890s, there's an, a really bad economic depression in the early part of that decade. And between the Republican and Populist parties, they take back in 1894 through a fusion of the two parties. There wasn't a fusion party. The Republicans populist parties just agreed not to run against one another and support each other's candidates in certain locations and on the state ticket. But there was a fusion of the Republican and populist parties that won back the legislature in 1894 from the Democrats. So, and then in 1896, they won the trifecta when Republican Daniel Russell wins the governorship. So. What happened here in North Carolina didn't happen in any other Southern state. Republicans never gained uh, this kind of uh, wins anywhere else. It was only in North Carolina. But in North Carolina, what happened was a whiplash because of the Democratic Party. They conducted what were, have been termed the white supremacy campaigns of 1898 and 1900. They ran on the race card. They spread fears about Negro domination. And that's where the cover of the book comes from. There was never Negro domination. There were a handful of black members of the North Carolina General Assembly. There were some deputy sheriffs. There were some local officials, magistrates, but there was no black sheriff in North Carolina. There was no black member of any county commission in the state. And so to, you know, create this fake history, false news that, uh, that uh, Blacks were running the show somehow uh, was a, a real feat for the Democrats to pull off, but they did it. They essentially drew the line and said, which side are you supporting, Blacks or your own, your own race? And to whites, that really resonated uh, for, for whatever reason. And they, and they were falsehoods. Like I said, there were only a handful of Blacks in the General Assembly. That wasn't a huge voting block, and they didn't control any uh, of the local centers of power either. And the fear was, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, that political equality allowing blacks to participate politically would somehow lead to social equality. And the Democratic Party uh, tied that up into kind of the virtuosity of white womanhood and the dangers posed by social equality to, to white women. And at the end of the 1898, political campaign, you do have the Wilmington coup d'etat, the racial massacre that occurred on November the 10th, 1898. A lot more went into those white supremacy campaigns than Wilmington. Wilmington is the flashpoint. Wilmington is the you know culmination of what happens in 1898, but it was going on across the state. Wilmington was, was not the only thing that happened that uh, made uh, 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 African-Americans fearful about going to the polls and things like that. The Wilmington coup d'etat and massacre happened for a very strong, you know, it was it happened for a reason. Wilmington was a Republican stronghold. It had a very high uh, black population. And as a result, it had uh, mostly Republican members uh, on local uh, boards and on the local commissions and in the legislature. Wilmington was the 
largest city at, at this time. Wilmington was the largest city in the state. There was a meeting the morning after the election. So the election already happens. You know, whites take back the, you know, white Democrats take back the General Assembly. But the day after they have a meeting in downtown Wilmington, they demand the resignations of the chief of police and the mayor who were not on the ballot. They weren't running for anything. Those offices weren't up until the next year, but they asked for the resignations of those white Republicans. Violence breaks out the next morning. This is a condensation of a very complex set of events, but on November the 10th, it starts at the Daily Record newspaper, which was a black newspaper in the city. There's a whole uh, history with that and what happened and the owner of that paper, Alex Manley, but they burn that paper and then the white groups start spreading out across the city. We ultimately don't know how many people were killed. No whites were killed. We know that 22 individual blacks were known dead and nine blacks were known to be wounded but whose fate were unknown. Those numbers are an absolute floor, but it's not the ceiling. We have no real idea how many ultimately died, but those were uh, uh, from the uh, commission study that was done. Those were numbers where multiple sources, multiple newspaper stories in different newspapers recorded that an individual bodies was in an individual's body was located here. Another body was at this intersection of streets. And so that is, th these were known, but how many ultimately were killed, we'll, we'll never know. It did re result in the re resignations of the city alderman and the mayor and the chief of police. It caused a lot of the black families to flee out of town. Some of them, some uh, uh, black businessmen and office holders were put on trains to the north and told never to come back. And so you see the next day's paper, this, this is from the News and Observer Friday morning, November the 11th, and it has a picture of Alfred Moore Waddell, who was one of the leaders of the coup. And it says, as you can see at the bottom, if you can read that, the new mayor of Wilmington who was elected yesterday. Well, there was no election. There was only firing of guns and murder. So that is what happened in Wilmington. And he was uh, a beneficiary of this coup. And it is the only known coup in the United States where force has resulted in the displacement of elected, democratically elected officials and uh, the installation of people who uh, uh, were in fact wielding the guns. So the election of 1900 was more of the same. The disenfranchisement amendment to the state constitution was passed by voters. And at the end of this period, Henry Connor, who is the speaker of the house and the general assembly says in that quote I have, that politicians have stirred the minds and feelings of the people more deeply than they intended. They really set the forces of racism, uh, you know, it's not that there wasn't racism before these political campaigns, there was. But the way that this kind of contagion took hold, it really affected North Carolina in very profound ways. So the Jim Crow laws, which I set out to catalog and find as many as I could from 1865 to 1920, I define not just as segregation, because to speak of disenfranchisement, that's not a segregation issue per se. There were no black voting booths and white voting booths. It was simply a way to keep blacks off of the voter rolls. So I define Jim Crow laws more broadly just to be a discrimination against blacks or American Indians. There are laws that pertain to uh, what today are called the Lumbees, but at the time in 1880s were <laughs> labeled in the statute books, the Croatan Indians of North Carolina. Croatan being the word that was carved into the tree that we all know from uh, uh, the lost colony and, and that story. But uh, the, the Lumbees at that time were labeled as the Croatan Indians of North Carolina in statute books. So I, I created two lists in my book. In the discriminatory list though, I don't include a lot of segregation laws early on in, in that list. And why was because segregation, and this is a very hard thing to kind of understand the mindset, but segregation was not a per se evil, even among the blacks uh, at right after the Civil War. 
And that's because the alternative to seg we think of the alternative to segregation as being integration, about institutions being free and have no racial barriers to blacks, whites, and any other uh, racial group. But the alternative to segregation in, in 1870 was not integration. It was total exclusion. And so even black politicians, black leaders favored segregated hospitals, segregated asylums, separating uh, segregated schools, because that was a half low solution for many. It was better than nothing. And so it, you know, just to be honest, I don't think the white population would have accepted desegregated schools, integrated schools in 1870, 1875. And so segregated schools were better than having no schools at all, even if they were poor, poorly funded. So one of the things I want to point out is that there were a lot of laws during this time that were, you know, to our modern reading doesn't look all that discriminatory, but they were enforced in different ways. And one of the points I want to make is you've heard the old saw that, well, you know, I mean, because this this attitude is out there that that the blacks were made free in 1865 and they've been on a level playing field ever since. And that's just not true. The ways the even neutrally sounding laws were applied were unfair. So this vagrancy law about people who are wandering around with no apparent means of subsistence is guilty of a misdemeanor. Well, after slavery ended, there were a lot of people a lot of the freedmen, a lot of the uh, freed women traveling about the South, trying to reunite families. They'd been split up. They were trying to travel, find their families. They were just trying to travel also just because they didn't want to be on the same plantation, living with the same master. So there was a lot of travel. They didn't have employment. But if you went through a town and got picked up, you could be convicted for vagrancy. And so this allowed, in some sense, essentially slavery under a different guise. These people were put, as you can see, upon, this is from the statute itself, upon conviction, the court may fine or imprison him or both and sentence him to the workhouse for such time as the court may think fit. And so laws like that and apprenticeship laws were used against blacks to in some sense reestablish a form of slavery under less, uh, 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 more neutral sounding kind of statutes. Also, in terms of there not being a level playing field, the legislatures in all the Southern states after 1865 worked to weaken black political power where it existed. And one of these case studies is in here in North Carolina. What you see here is a picture of New Hanover County in 1874. As I said previously, Wilmington, New Hanover was a Republican stronghold and it was a, a stronghold because of the large black population in Wilmington. Well, what the white legislature, remember it's been redeemed by 1874, the white legislature in Raleigh passes a law to split New Hanover. And you get in the next picture, this is from later in the 1800s, a picture of what happened. So the Northern part of New Hanover County is cut off and made into Pender County, which would allow for white power to come from that county and to pack all Republican black political power into the little sliver of New Hanover and Wilmington that is left. In addition to the state laws, there are also city ordinances. You see the city ordinance from Raleigh uh, segregating the cemeteries here in town, but there were also city ordinances in Mooresville and Winston before it, you know, shortly before it became Winston-Salem and Greensboro, which passed residential segregation ordinances. These were laws which said blacks can't live in this town. The one in Mooresville set out particular streets they couldn't live on. And so this was an attempt to create residential segregation by law. That was struck down, the Winston law was struck down within a couple of years by the state Supreme Court and these laws as a whole were disallowed by the US Supreme Court. But it was an attempt by some of these cities to if, in, in effect pack the black population into certain parts of town and to keep them from moving elsewhere within the city limits. Here is a list of some of the laws that I found over time 
You see the laws about segregating township schools, county schools uh, to be segregated. The jails had to be seg racially segregated. And one of the things, if you don't know about this, you see the 1880 and 1883 laws where tax dollars were attempted to be segregated. That white tax dollars would only go to white schools. Black tax dollars would only go to black schools. And if you know anything about property holding, especially in the years right after the Civil War, the black population would not have a sizable property uh, holding to be taxed. And so the goal of the redeem legislatures was to strengthen white schools and not have whites funding black schools. So that was struck down too by the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, and you see some of the other laws segregating cemeteries. And then after the white supremacy campaign, I know I'm running fast and running a little late, but the uh, statutes segregated the railroads and the steamboats. And in 1900, you get the constitutional amendment that was ratified. What happened and what surprised me was that you would think that once blacks were removed from the voter rolls by the disenfranchisement amendment, you would have a wave of new statutes that they would essentially pile on now that blacks had no retaliation, no power to, to vote for anybody else who would change that. But from 1900, when the constitutional amendment is ratified, there are no new laws until the, in 1907, there's a passage of a law requiring segregation on streetcars. So that didn't mean things were good, but it did mean that they didn't see the uh, statutes as being a way to enforce Jim Crow. What happens is the laws that exist are being used in certain discriminatory ways. Again, I say that the society changed with the contagion of those white supremacy campaigns. If you look at the disenfranchisement amendment. Here's the language from it, that every person presenting himself for registration shall be able to read and write any section of the constitution in the English language. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. Black voting had been very strong, especially relative to the other Southern states here in North Carolina. A scholar named Morgan Kouser, who was one of C. Van Woodward's students at Yale, ran these numbers and came up with very complex statistical studies that showed the levels of black voting in these gubernatorial elections up to 1896. And you can see it's quite high. It's quite high even for uh, 2020 uh, uh, numbers. But here were the illiter illiteracy rates from the US census. So they used the term colored in the 1900 census and the illiteracy rate was 53.1. Well, that means that there's almost 50% who are literate. And in 1910, you see the illiteracy rate being 38.6. Well, that means that over 60% were judged by the Census Bureau to be literate in North Carolina. Yet, how was that language that we saw about reading and writing any provision of the Constitution? The result was that from Manio to Murphy to every county, there weren't any outliers. Kouser finds that the effective voting rate in 1904 in the gubernatorial election for blacks is zero. That's not a rounding error. I mean, the, you, you could say that the Census Bureau doesn't know how to count literacy. Well, that may be true, but it's certainly not the case that zero blacks are being, uh, 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 are, zero blacks are literate in this state. And so it is very strange to me that there's no variance. It happens at one time. There is no county outlier, even in some of the eastern uh, counties where you have any kind of black participation. And so the text of the law doesn't matter there. Public school funding is the same. The public school funding laws remained unchanged after the white supremacy campaigns in 1900. Yet if you look at what happens, the operation of the law changes drastically. In 1896 to 1900, the poverty of, uh, you know, North Carolina, was a terrible funder of public schools back then. It was even worse than it is today, if that's hard to grasp. It was the worst in the country. And so uh, you see the numbers, which were not far off. But by 1910, you see a vast difference. Black per capita expenditures of a dollar and a half for blacks. For whites, it's well over twice that, $3.70. And so the conclusions I want you to take away from this was that there were discriminatory laws enacted starting in 1865, not later. The, the 
forgotten alternatives and all that stuff. There were statutes from the very get-go after slavery ended. There was no new tidal wave. There was no tsunami of new statutes after the white supremacy campaigns. And the discrimination was taking place by the existing statutes and just through the operation, operation and interpretation of those laws. The number and existence of statutes does not create the full measure of the de jure discrimination. That's not, I'm talking about discrimination by government in North Carolina. So it was the operation of those laws, the implementation, the interpretation of those laws, which almost mattered more, especially in that first decade after 1900, than the number of statutes themselves. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn, welcome Christy back. Job. So thank you. And there's so much there. Um, and having read most of your book too, there's so much there that we could talk for an hour. But I do want to kind of um, start with sticking with this issue. You know, in your book, you say law is always a reflection of the times and of the people for better or for worse. And that constitutions and statutes are written within the tides and currents of their times. And they are in turn interpreted and applied within those same waters. So I think it's really interesting the position that you take that the laws alone don't necessarily explain the comprehensiveness of the system because so much was about the way that it was interpreted, the way it was enacted. You know, for one, I was super surprised. You would think after the white supremacy campaign, there would have just been tons of laws passed, but that wasn't the case because, you know, perhaps they didn't need them because of the laws that were already there or, you know, the kind of white power structure is in place. Yeah, you know, to some degree that's uh, poking a stick at lawyers because lawyers often go to law school and think, you know, that law is just some logical system, that, that uh, law is autonomous from what goes on out in the real world. Well, if you want to uh, interpret this law, if you want to interpret this provision of the Constitution, uh, it's really just an exercise in logic and that, you know, the outside forces of the world don't play any role. And mm -hmm. that, that's just not true. Mm -hmm as objective as we can, but we can't take ourselves out of the time and place where we exist. And so to think by 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education, that's segregated schools, it's, it's okay that they, you know, are, you know, African Americans are getting just the same education as, as blacks, sorry, as whites, uh, is, is just a fallacy. And so you only need to look outside your window to see that. And so the, the interpretation of the law in Brown versus Board of, Board of Education reflects that and reflects that you get nine justices, you get a united Supreme Court, no dissents for that proposition. Mm -hmm. And rejection of Plessy versus Ver Ferguson, which is in 1896, and that worldview, which had the view that if there was segregation and, and you thought that this was bad, it's given your interpretation of it, it has nothing to do with the real world. Well, all of this has uh, implications in the real world and interpretation of law is going to be influenced by the times we live in. Right. It was really interesting too. I know you wrote um, in that period, and I never knew this exact number, but following, you know, the all eyes have been on North Carolina as of late with an attempted coup on our Capitol. You know, I know a lot of folks have been kind of refocusing on what happened in 1898, but you wrote that in the first decade of the 20th century, one out of every 13 African Americans left North Carolina because of, and do you think that that's because of, um, you know, these Jim Crow laws are playing a part of that, the residual effect of the Wilmington coup are, are playing a part of that push? Yeah, and it and it's you know I I don't uh, want to minimize what happened in Wilmington, but the white supremacy campaigns were something that went on from one end of the state to another. Right, that's right. It's a flashpoint. It is a very bad flashpoint, and it is you know Exhibit A for what happened during those years. But the tone, the racial tone, the racial hostility in North Carolina was you know North Carolina, as I said you know, had relatively a uh, relatively democratic system of late, late 1890s. It had very high levels of African-American political participation. That was men at the time because women weren't in, entitled to vote during this period. But they had very high levels of participation. And North Carolina from that moderate kind of position, you would think, flips 
and goes through something really, you know, at the same time that no other Southern state had uh, its legislature and governor's mansion taken over by Republicans, no Southern state at the same time went through what North Carolina went through, which was these kind of white supremacy campaigns, which were really, you know, this, you know, contagion that mm -hmm. affected the minds of, of, of especially of whites living here and drew a racial line and viewed you as a traitor if you voted Republican because Republicans were a supporter of some level of equality. Right. Yeah, I'm, I appreciate you for bringing that up. I put in the chat box there um, a book, Wilmington's Lie by David Zucchino, and he talks a lot about that. And I think it's really important for all of us to know we can't just look to Wilmington because it was literally every city, you know, he talks about so many documented rallies of thousands of people of red shirts in Fayetteville, in Lexington, and, you know, just about every town you can get to. This was definitely a statewide white supremacy campaign and propaganda campaign to uh, pretty much just remove any kind of black leadership. So I think that's a really right. they, important point. So they, had, so they had these political rallies. They didn't have TV, they didn't have radio, they didn't have newspapers. And telegrams, they had their telegrams. <laughs> they had telegrams and they probably had semaphore, but they, the Democrats put, had a, you know, essentially a speaker's bureau and sent these people one end of the state to the other to speak at these rallies mm -hmm. with red shirts who were this kind of paramilitary operation. It, they were more open than the Klan was, but they rode with uh, on horseback. They had Winchester rifles. It was a, originally came out of South Carolina. People like Ben Tillman had been red shirts in South Carolina, had been responsible for things like the Hamburg massacre in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But red shirts start appearing in North Carolina with 1898 they are shooting and you know scaring people away from the polls. Things were at such a level that the Dem uh, Republican governor, Daniel Russell, takes the slate of people to be elected from Wilmington off the ballot. He just, you, you think that's kind of crazy, but that was the level of things that were happening in the state before election day even. He was told that if you allow you know, a fair vote, on this and the elect Republicans get elected, well, it's going to, you know, it'll result in revolution. Well, it resulted in kind of revolution anyway. Mm. They were fearful enough of that that they simply pulled the Republicans off the ballot and Democrats won because there were no opposition <laughs> candidates. Right, was, right. That was the level of fear that, that happened. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, as we talk here, we have several, several questions. Shana from Caldwell, Samuel from Granville, Benny from Guilford, all great teachers. Hi, Benny. Um, a lot of folks are asking a similar question, kind of thinking about North Carolina as a state and given the diversity of our state, you know, you have a very different world in the mountains, you know, in Jackson County than you do here in Chapel Hill than you do in say Lumberton. And so would you say that Jim Crow was practiced and enforced differently in the various regions of the state? I know you touched on this a little bit when you said Jim Crow kind of was born in the cities because you know that's where your streetcars are and things like that. But is there anything that came up in your research regarding kind of um, whether it was unanimous or, or kind of different just based on where you were? No, it, it would vary over time. One of the things to keep in mind about North Carolina was North Carolina was one of the most unurban states in the union at this time. It did not have large, like, you know, given that Wilmington was the largest city, you know, Charlotte had not boomed, Greensboro had really not boomed, Raleigh had not boomed at that time. So there are electric streetcars in most other states and North Carolina is get streetcars. You don't need to worry about segregation on streetcars until you get streetcars. Right. So uh, you have, especially in, you, so you see a lot of variation. So in the Eastern counties where you have uh, large black populations, you would have some cross aisle kind of political accommodations where even, you know, this is before 1898, Democrats would work with black Republicans give them a seat or two on the school board to try to pull them in and co-opt them to ensure some kind of peace and not cut them out of power entirely. So you see some kind of workings like that, but you're going to see variations 
in terms of uh, tone from the mountains to say the eastern part of the states where there are high, you know, you often would see, you know, more hard line kind of racial attitudes in the high minority areas of the state mm. compared to uh, in the mountains. Now that doesn't mean that there was no discrimination in the mountains. Some of the mountain counties were what you'd call sundown counties where they had, you know, signs which would say, you know, if you're black, don't, we don't want to see your face after sundown. You couldn't have that in a Wayne County where you have a very high, I mean, that's, that's not a, a enforceable possibility. You can only do that where the minority population is relatively low. So I don't mean to say that the mountain counties are free of, of, of discrimination and that the Republican whites in the mountains were all that friendly with the Republican blacks in the eastern part of the state. But you are going to see variations in terms of residential segregation, segregation in terms of schools and then on streetcars between, say, Wilmington, Goldsboro, and Winston and Winston-Salem, Morganton, those, those types of, of towns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I want to point out, we were getting a lot of questions. A lot of folks are asking about specific areas. A lot of folks are wanting to know what was happening in their specific county or their specific town. Unfortunately, we can't get into all of the specifics with all, you know, almost 300 of you. But I will say in the back of Richard's amazing book, um, he's got a lot of these laws cataloged. And then also later on, we're going to be looking at the online site on the books where you can enter and search by your particular area. So just uh, we'll show you how to do that kind of offline on your own, because I know I think that's really compelling history for students, too, when you talk about what was happening right in your very town or your very county. Um, like I said earlier, that's history you can touch. So we will show you how to be able to do that work. Um, Richard, one thing I wanted to ask you. Um, what about gender? How does gender weave into the history of Jim Crow in North Carolina? Gender is a really interesting <clears throat> kind of a, a feature of this. I touched on it a little bit. Some of the political rhetoric that was being thrown around by the Democrats in 1898 and 1900 centered on this kind of preservation of white womanhood, this danger that, well, if we allow Blacks into the political system, then we're going to ultimately have social equality. And if you're going to have social equality, you're going to have miscegenation. That kind of preservation of this kind of virginal white womanhood is, is everywhere. It mm -hmm. touched on in virtually every talk. And it is something that animates, you can, you know, you, you can understand that they are going to be in, in kind of an honor culture in, in 1900 in North Carolina, a lot of white men are going to be animated and driven to do certain things if they believe that their women are endangered by these. And they, you know, used very, you know, basic terms about black brutes and black bucks and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of card was played. And if you, if you look at what happens, uh, Glenda Gilmore, who's a professor at Yale, uh, has written an important study on, on this too. And so what you find is, and you read, it's called, her book is called Gender and Jim Crow. And it's about North Carolina. She is from here in North Carolina. She went to Wake Forest and got her uh, a PhD at Chapel Hill. But what happens is after black men are disenfranchised in 1900, what you see is black women being a power center. They are the go-betweens. They are the ones who can get things done for their communities in a way that their disenfranchised uh, partners are not able to. Right. And gender is a, a, a really interesting thread that runs through all this, the way it is intertwined with racial fears and racial antagonism during this period. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. In David Zucchino's book, Wilmington's Lie, I mentioned earlier, he talked about one of the boldest challenges to the white supremacy taking place in Wilmington in the 1890s was from women who came together and formed an organization of colored ladies. It was an organization of working women, the maids, the nannies, the um, laundresses who spoke out and could advocate in a way that their uh, husbands and partners could not. So 
Um, I think it's, you know, often women, I think, are overlooked in these periods, but played such a key role in many complex and varied ways. So I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, So we've had several just really great questions. Um, Amy Nathan is asking, how does your collection of laws differ from Polly Murray's work of 1950? Uh, do you have any, did you consult her work, you know, and how incredible if you all are not teaching about Polly Murray, you must, we have a wonderful lesson plan on her. Hopefully Paul can pop that in the chat for you. I mean, she, you want to talk about a trailblazing, amazing woman. Um, and I know this work was so difficult for you to do. I can't imagine for her in 1950, but are there comparisons there? Did you consult her work? Yeah. So, uh, this gets a little bit, uh, in, into the weeds, but let me be as uh, brief as I can. So Polly Murray is, um, she, she is this amazing woman and she is practicing law in New York City uh, in the 1940s. And she is, uh, a, a similar grant is proposed to her that that organization reaches out to her to try to find discriminatory laws throughout the United States. And she publishes a book on that. What she uses are what are called code compilations. Usually when practicing attorneys look for a law, they look for things in what are called codes, which are compilations of laws by subject matter, essentially. So when the North Carolina legislature in 2019 passes a law, it eventually is, finds a place in the code. So first it's passed and is part of the session laws, and then it's part of the codes. So what I did was because the session laws So the session laws have a lot of things that affect local government that the codes are meant to be kind of general. They're not, they don't contain like that statute that was in my PowerPoint about the segregation of cemeteries in Morganton because that didn't apply everywhere. You wouldn't have that in a code. But what Pauli Murray did was she went to the New York Bar Library and started pulling the codes off the shelf and reading all these statutes, which, which was just a Herculean task, mm-hmm. find statutes and some, but some to some degree, she's limited by what's put in those code provisions and who the code compilers were, because you have to have somebody who's going to take the session laws and stick them in in the proper places in the codes. I at least had the benefit that most of the session laws for each year, for each legislative session, 1865, 1865. 1866, 1866, 1866, all those have now been digitized. And so you're relying on how searchable they are and how good the copies are of the PDFs that have been made. But at least I uh, had the benefit of having some of this done electronically, but I went through the session laws to try to capture all these local laws too. Pauli Murray was using the codes and did not have the benefit of that those uh, codes were digitized and were, was doing it essentially all by hand and writing it out by hand on, on uh, legal pads. And so she did amazing work and, I, you know, it's more than uh, I can fathom, but, uh, you know, it was hard enough doing it, you know, using terms and searching PDFs as I did. Right. Well, especially since you say yourself, so many of these laws were camouflaged, you know, they weren't um, obvious on the surface. So... Right. So, you know, I started, you know, searching terms that you would think would be, you know, in a Jim Crow kind of discrimination statute, color, race, Negro, uh, uh, um, mulatto, um, Indian, these types of terms, Croatan, those types of things. But you're going to find a lot of things like the vagrancy law I showed, apprenticeship laws, you know, that come up that way, but that were very much a part of this system of Jim Crow discrimination imposed by government. And to jump on that, since you just brought that up, I think one of, um, we often think of Jim Crow in terms of black and white, but in actuality, you know, especially in North Carolina, we have such a high population of indigenous people. And so could you speak a little bit about um, how other groups in North Carolina, such as the Lumbee, the Cherokee, you know, um, Mexican Americans, Latinx folks would have been impacted um, by these laws? Right. Well, I don't, I don't know the census numbers off the top of my head, but the um, numbers of, say, Asians and his, what we would today call Hispanics were not huge uh, up to 1920. There were some, uh, and they are registered on, especially on, in the later census num- 
uh, compilations, 1910, 1920. But we, do we did have a large uh, number of American Indians. Mm -hmm. Eastern Band of Cherokees had their own kind of, uh, they, they had their own system of schools. The main focus of the North Carolina legislature in terms of laws and whatnot were what we would today term lumbies. Mm -hmm. And so in the 1880s, you start seeing laws regarding the Croatan Indians of North Carolina, which were their terminology for what we would today term the lumbies. So in 1885, you have a statute which, like the statutes that defined what a Negro was, in 1885, you have a statute that defines what a, a Croatan Indian was. Mm -hmm. And it also said that blacks were not allowed in, in the schools for the Croatan Indians. So you had three different sets of schools down in Robinson County and, and anywhere you had a, a size one. You had, you had uh, Croatan Indians of North Carolina in the surrounding counties up into Sampson and in all those counties. So you see some laws in the 1880s and in 1887, there's a law prohibiting marriage between blacks and the Croatan Indians of North Carolina. And eventually you start seeing statutes that will set aside, again, this is kind of segregation stuff, it's half a loaf may be better than no loaf at all. You start seeing statutes that set aside some beds in the insane asylum, which was what the terminology was back then, for Croatan Indians who up until this time did not have any uh, help on the mental health uh, front, uh, the way that even, even Blacks had, had gotten a, a, a uh, a leg up on, on Croatans before that because they first had a few beds here in Raleigh and then they had the hospital in Goldsboro that what has become the Cherry Hospital uh, was the insane asylum for blacks starting in the 1880s. Um, this is an excellent question that's come in from Miss Best um, and she wants to know when eugenics laws in North Carolina came into play and, in, and is there a connection between laws related to eugenics and laws related to Jim Crow? For all the teachers listening in, we also have a really comprehensive lesson plan on North Carolina's eugenics program. It is probably one of the most hidden aspects of our state's history. Hopefully Paul can pop that in the chat box for you too. Um, but can you speak to that? Was there a, a connection, a relationship between those laws? There, there's not laws on eugenics in the period I studied. You, you do have the what is a Negro kind of definitional kind of laws, but a lot of, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm starting to get out of my depth, but there, there weren't statutes uh, create, and you know, that's, that's gonna be the case for a lot of things. When we speak about water fountains, about mm -hmm. theaters with um, uh, the balconies being, um, uh, reserved for blacks only. Often there was not statutes or city ordinances that that was the theater owner and he was simply going by societal forces to do that. Now the eugenics program here in North Carolina does obviously have a government component, but I don't know if there's a statute, it, it's after 1920 that that statute comes mm -hmm. in. But this is a, this is a period, I mean, the, to me, the eugenics movement really you know, starts building uh, strength in the 1890s and the, the social Darwinism. And so there is um, um, some uh, belief about breeding and that the purity of genes and, and stuff like that. But to my knowledge, I, I did not discover a statute granting localities power about sterilization and things like that, at least right. in 1920. And similar things, like there are a lot of Jim Crow laws that I don't get to in 1920. There's a statute later that segregates school books. You couldn't keep the white children's school books in the same place with the black children's school books. That's a statute, but it's after 1920. So I, I, I didn't never found anything with regard to eugenics specifically or giving any state agency the power to do that uh, that I know of in, in, in right. research. Really just uh, horrific, but important history. Paul put that link in the chat box there for you. It is related. Um, and one of the few times when, you know, reparations have actually been given by the state, very minor reparations, but reparations nonetheless. Um, I want to ask you, Richard, you know, so many teachers just given what's 
been happening in the world, especially just within the past month, are asking about the connection between this history that you've so diligently researched in today. Um, you know, you wrote on page 181 of your book that discrimination and subordination by government and governmental actors have left an undeniable footprint on America's history and that they cast a long shadow over the present day. Can you explain what you mean by that? Maybe offer some examples. Sure. So um, you're going to see in, in a lot of what's what I talk about, school funding, for example, uh, the absence of blacks from jury pools, mm. going to see those ripples take place for generations. So if you have poorly funded black schools in 1910, you're going to be educating the black children in a way that is going to impact their earning power, their ability to get certain jobs for generations. And so th those kind of ripples take place over and over at the same place in, in the jury pools. If you're gonna essentially have all white jury pools, guess what? You're, you're going to have a discriminatory kind of prosecutorial system where you do are gonna have few checks on the uh, conviction of black defendants in, in a way that a mixed jury might put a break on that. You're going to see um, uh, a greater rate of incarceration, even coming out of, I mean, we talk about mass incarceration today, but you're going to see, you know, central prison and the chain gang and the, the work release kind of, not work release, but the, 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 fun, the funded hiring of inmates out of central prison, which was, again, another almost kind of essentially slavery type of, of system, which allowed uh, railroads and whatever to buy these workers and to treat them terribly. Many died in, in the awful work that they did and created a, a similar system, you know, not, not all that different from slavery. But any law you're going to see impacts. And one of the things I talk about a little bit in the book is the segregation, residential segregation that came out of the New Deal. Because one of the things that was created in the New Deal was the Federal Housing Administration. And the Federal Housing Administration has done a lot of good. It uh, did not loan money, but it guaranteed loans for a wide swath of American people. But at the same time it did that, it imposed regulations on how those loans were to be made. And it disfavored loans to houses in black areas of town. It benefited the suburbs and the white sections of town in certain ways. And then it, the Federal Housing Administration put the screws to the localities to say that your zoning ordinances need to say the same thing, which was to create single family home zoning regulations to create large lot sizes, all things which in the absence of any kind of background knowledge, you wouldn't think has any kind of racial impact but by not allowing multifamily kind of housing, duplexes, triplexes, apartment complexes, you are weeding out uh, uh, potentially minority communities that would live in suburbs um, are, are all over this country. And so those rules have had a ripple effect. We such laws would be struck down today as being uncon unquestionably unconstitutional, but the ripple effects of that segregated uh, residential system for financing houses and housing loans, mortgages, you know, you can see it in what has, has happened and how the cities of, of this country exist. You know, the, the interstates, you know, Kevin Cruz has an important book about Atlanta. The, tr you know, the crazy track that the interstate highways took in Atlanta was, wasn't, you know, out of the blue. It was because they went through the black neighborhoods because that was where they bought the, the land. Right. And place those communities. And oh, so we have that even here in North Carolina, right through yeah. Durham's beautiful Haiti community. They took Highway 147 and just turned that community upside down. It was thriving. So to think that exactly. That was and so you'll you'll see this in all kinds of ways in Durham right. 147 with school placement, where schools were located. What was the uh, white school placed here? Was the black school placed here? All those kind of decisions 
which for a long time we kind of thought of as well, you know, it's just that was the decision that was made and race didn't play any part well. Now, you know, really with open eyes, we can see that race mm -hmm. did play a part in, in all these decisions about siting of schools, siting of interstates and the like. Right. I'll ask Paul if he can find it. We have a great lesson on Haiti um, and that scenario in our database as well. But, you know, it's really interesting if you just look at just two of those examples you said from the educational disparities to how that might lead to underemployment or a lack of employment leading to low wage earning. That is a direct impact on intergenerational wealth. There's been so much about how Black folks, especially the intergenerational wealth just is not there. And it's a direct line back to exactly what you're talking about. I think, you know, the same is true for housing. If you think about a lot of folks, the biggest asset that they're leaving behind is a home that they've owned for many years. And if you were a victim of redlining or predatory lending or couldn't get a loan because of race, then that's going to impact you. And these are areas of history that are fact. There, are, there's you know plenty of documentation on multiple fronts to to prove this. And so I think that's as you said, work like what you've done is so important to open our eyes and see that. So um, now that said, we know that this this all gets a little heavy, right? And one of the things that um, Carolina K-12 really pushes teachers to do with their students is to always teach the resistance. Um, Jim Crow is hard history. You know, it, it can make students of all races feel very upset. Um, and what we don't want is our students to develop, um, you know, to feel victimized, to feel beaten down. We want to teach them in this history, but in a way that empowers them, in a way that gives them hope. That's one of the things that we're always pushing because I think throughout every period of history, including Jim Crow, there's so much resistance, people from ordinary to extraordinary pushing back, fighting back, stepping up and showing agency, um, you know, whether we know about the sit-ins and the freedom rides, the fill up the jails um, that took place. So Gina from Wake is asking, are there any other countermeasures that you might highlight that we might not know about were there any legislators who tried to push back on this lawmaking? Um, any, anything that you might highlight in terms of the agency and the pushback and that piece of resistance and hope? So I'd, I'd say a couple of things. One is there's certainly a lot of black agency in reconstruction and in the decades after 1865. You saw it with, you know, there were black legislatures in every session of the North Carolina General Assembly uh, from in the decades after the Civil War, mm -hmm. a constant feature, and they had political power because mm -hmm. of rates of voting. George Henry White, amazing. Paul put the lesson on George Henry White in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so one of one of the things was the the black population in Eastern North Carolina was large enough to we would today term it packing the district, but they, they packed uh, the black areas black in one congressional mm -hmm. district and that became what was termed the black second. Mm -hmm. They had representation uh, up until 1901 when uh, white uh, was voted out of office uh, in Congress from North Carolina. Now, that said, after 1898 and 1900, black agency becomes more constrained but I'll, I'll say, I'll say two, one thing about black agency and other thing about um, dissenting voices. When there is the 1907 law, which imposes streetcar segregation by race, there is a pushback and there is in certain towns and this included Wilmington, a boycott movement on the plaque of, on the part of black residents to not ride on the segregated streetcars. Now, this, this wasn't, you know, 1950s, 1960s. It ultimately, you know, did not result in the desegregation of the streetcars, but it was an effort to point out that we don't like these kind of laws. We don't like being put in a particular part of the streetcar. And most of the streetcar, you know, one of the things to say about all this is on the railroads and the streetcars, these streetcar companies, the railroads didn't want these Jim Crow laws. They they really fought, and it's really kind of amazing that they, you know, they put up fights in the legislature tooth and nail to try not to have these Jim Crow laws. And you'd 
think, well, why? They were, you know, white corporations. Why do they care? Well, they're the ones who are on the front lines trying to enforce this. So they are the ones who are having to, the railroads having to run an extra car for the black passengers, which cost more money. You had to buy the car. You had to fuel the engine to pull a heavier train. And it also puts you on the front lines, though, of people who bought tickets and having to confront them like, well, you look awfully white. I'm not sure you're full white. Come on, get in your grill and you know, say, you got to move back to this other part of the car. The railroads didn't want that job. And so they really did not want the, and the street cars were the same way. They didn't want to have to enforce these kind of rules on, you know, paying customers, which they all, you know, you know, they just didn't want a part of this. So there, there were boycotts of street cars after the street car laws passed in 1907 in some localities. Not every city in North Carolina had street cars by 1907. And one thing I'll say about dissenters in, in politics. And this, this is a complicated area, and I, I don't want to be misunderstood for what I'm saying. But in, in, the, in terms of white politicians, th there is, you know, undeniably a, a, an aspect where all of these people were white supremacists. There is nothing like a believer in full equality for the black population in 1900 and in, in the white population. It just, it doesn't exist. I, you know, if, if there is such a person, they're not writing about it. The uh, professor over at Duke, Bassett, who talks, uh, you know, makes some uh, overtures that, you know, black shouldn't be treated so well. Well, the News and Observer and Josephus Daniels put up this huge fight that he ought to be fired out of Duke for even speaking up in even a little way for the back black population. So, but, ba but Bassett, even in, in those kind of ways, was not a full on, you know, both races are equal. There was a pretty, you know, basic belief among whites that they were a superior race. And this goes back to the, you know, kind of racial genetic superiority that whites thought of themselves. But within this world, there are degrees of difference between Bassett and other people. And so there's a spectrum of white supremacy, some worse than others. And one thing, and again, I don't want to be misunderstood from what I've said, but one person who did, it, it, there's a more complex picture than what has existed up until this time is Charles Brantley Aycock. Mm. Aycock becomes governor in 1900. He is a white supremacist. There is no question. And he said some really God awful things on the stump. He was part of the Speaker's Bureau in 1898. Mm -hmm. He ran for governor in 1900. He believed in the supremacy of the white race. At the same time, when he became governor, that idea that I mentioned during my slideshow about segregating school tax dollars by race reared its head again. The state Supreme Court had struck the statute down, but the legislature at the time that Aycock was governor wanted to make it a constitutional amendment and to have a North Carolina constitutional amendment which segregated tax dollars, white for white schools, black for black schools. And Charles Brantley Aycock said that if that were enacted, he would resign. And so again, I don't want to be misunderstood. He's not you know, some full on equality person. He, he said some really awful things, but he stepped in front of that train in the years after 1900 in a way that makes little political sense. Why would you step in front of that legislative train when so many in your Democratic Party want to pass it and you're stepping it, uh, trying to stop something on the race issue that would perhaps benefit Blacks? Mm -hmm. But my, my point is that these, these pictures are often more complex than we give them credit for. He knew that that would hurt Black schools. And so he didn't believe that, you know, and he thought it would hurt the state long term. I mean, to some degree, you know, I don't want to overstate the case, but he was a all ships and are going to rise on the same tide that we can't leave the black citizens fully behind and think that that's going to be okay for the state long term. Mm -hmm. So whatever his reasons were, whatever, you know, because his reasons were almost certainly not be our reasons for why we ought to have equal funding of schools. He did work and that amendment was dropped and they didn't
go forward with it because of what ACOC did. And so there are degrees of difference and some complexity here that often gets washed out in, in our understanding of what happened during these periods. I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And I know it's something teachers struggle with all the time when you have limited time, you know, these are living, breathing, complex people. Um, you know, ACOC, yes, is involved in the white supremacy of 1898, but that doesn't mean every decision he ever made, you know, did nothing for the state. It's very complicated. And I think that's that right there alone would be a really interesting debate for students to get into, right? To, to look at some of his, um, legislation and to think about how do we remember, how do we judge um, those who came before us. And I think with that too, you know, there's just such incredible folks from Ida B. Wells. Um, we have a lesson, maybe Paula Post in there for you guys um, during this time, North Carolina's own Abraham Galloway, Polly Murray, Robert Williams, you know, we do have these um, black folks and people of color who are really pushing back in such brave and courageous and effective ways. And I think making sure that we tell those stories while we talk about Jim Crow, you know, to know what they're fighting only makes their sacrifices even that much more compelling and great, right? So we really encourage teachers to do that. Um, I wanna close, we're of course a little bit over time here and um, I'm sure you'd like to go home at some point tonight, Richard, but I wanna close with you actually with where I begin. I mentioned early on in my introduction that you actually opened your book with one of my most favorite quotes that, um, I have been coming back to so much in the last months, uh, which was the W.B. Du Bois quote, quote, that nations reel and stagger on their way, they make hideous mistakes, they commit frightful wrongs, they do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all of this so far as the truth is ascertainable? Frankly, I think what you were saying about ACOC connects very much to this quote, but um, I'd like to hear from you, just any final parting words to the teachers, and also, why did you choose this particular quote um, to open this book with? What's, what's the message you want to convey to these teachers in their marching orders this evening? Well, my commitment is to the history, and so I'm, you know, having said that, I'm committed to the complexity that exists here. It's not one-dimensional and never has been. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to the teachers is that, you know, I think my wife loves me warts and all for you know, both my, you know, faults, which are many, and some of the good things about me. And I think our nation, you know, is, is the same way. We're not going to have a, a true love that, you know, essentially denies the existence of some of what's gone on. And so you can teach history that is, uh, you know, more wide open eyed about what's happened and is not constrained and afraid to look around the corner at some of these dark things. Not everything has been good. That's right. So I would say that an, an American history that looks at our faults, what has been done to make ourselves a more perfect union over time, it's happened people like Pauli Murray and Galloway and, and everyone who has worked to strive, you know, whether it is economic uh, justice or racial freedom or racial equality or, or any kind of subject you can come up with. The idea that we are going to have an appreciation for what America is only comes through telling the good parts seems to me to deny the complexity and the nuance of our world, both today and in the past. And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't want history to become a judgment about certain people. I don't think the point of history is to haul people out and put them in the proverbial dock and put them on trial for what they did and didn't do. That's not the sole purpose of history. We are, you know, in, in significant ways better moral creatures, I think, than in some in the past. But we ought to know our history, both good and bad, what has been done to try to alleviate the problems that have existed through American history, whether it was through law or other, you know, matters, and to try to address it. And I think that 
you know, for me, I have a, you know, an appreciation for how we do try to accomplish things, compromise and get things done and to move the ball forward in this country. And, and that's a, you know, to me, a more profound lesson than thinking that everything has been okay and that any criticism of the country somehow diminishes the country. Yes. Take that 1776 commission. That was very well said. All the all the history teachers just said amen for sure. So, well, Richard Pascal, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I appreciate you. As soon as I said it was for teachers, you were on board and ready to roll. So we thank you for your time. We thank you for this really just comprehensive and important work that you've done. I know that the teachers who select this book are really going to enjoy it and get a lot of use out of it. So. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christy. It's been a pleasure. I would like to invite the incredible Noelle James on screen with us. Um, hi, Noelle. Good to see you. So Noelle is the amazing arts consultant who has basically brought the performance of the movement to North Carolina. She discovered this um, piece of children's theater and thought it was really important. I'm going to let her talk about all of that, but I want to tell you a little bit about the incredible Noelle James. She's an arts consultant who believes in the power of the arts for self-reflection, education, and understanding. She has produced and managed programs for cultural organizations, educational institutions, and municipal municipalities all over. Um, from serving as the Senior Director of Education at the Carolina Theater to serving as the Associate Dean and Director of Multicultural Cultural Affairs at Colby College. She's served on just about every arts board there is, so I'm not even going to go through that list, but I think what might be most important for you all to know is how much she supports and genuinely respects teachers and believes especially in teachers doing the type of work that we're talking about tonight, really kind of diving into the hard hidden history and shining light on it. So um, Noelle, like I said, is not only responsible for bringing the movement to North Carolina, even though tonight it's kind of different than what she originally envisioned last year, but she's also secured a link to the show for all of you. I wanna make sure you saw that as part of the registration. Each of you will be given your own link so that you can show your students anytime this week through Sunday, what you see tonight. Um, so maybe you'll wanna use an excerpt of the show or the entire show, that's completely up to you, but that's gonna be made available to you if you want that. And so Noelle, thank you for your work and for being with us. We're happy to have you here. And I wanted you to just take a minute and tell us, um, you know, I know, like I said, this looks a lot different than what you initially envisioned, but what was it about this show that caught your attention and made you feel that it's important for students and teachers alike in North Carolina to witness? Well, going back to what um, was stated earlier is about the complexity of our history mm. and because I've lived so much of it, because I'm such an old person, oh, <laughs> that I was unaware, even though I was eight years old um, during the march, that children played such a significant role during the resistance. So I think back in my mind, I was aware of that, but then to see it um, really brought it home that there's so many different elements of our history that just you put it aside because you can't imagine that children would be in the forefront of resistance. Yeah. And so when I saw this production in 2019 at the National Black Theater Festival, I hope everyone has an opportunity to see it in Winston-Salem. It's absolutely unbelievable. In terms of the artists, you would probably recognize a number of the actors that come to town to participate in stage readings of new works. But most importantly, it's an opportunity to see new works and to hear Felicia Rashad in a whole different, um, you know, environment. And so the reason I wanted to do this one, it's very good production. I forgot that the New York 
Theater Festival in 2019 also awarded this movement, an acapella musical, not only best choreography, best musical, and also best director. And okay. so that tells you something. Yeah. And, and we're going to meet her after the show here. Yes, you will. So I would say the main thing is the more information we find out, the more helpful it would be for us to share the whole complexity of it. Right, right. And even tonight, I was surprised and reminded how many people work so hard to create segregation, the number of laws, and the amount of money. So imagine if we all work together and put all those resources for equality and social yes. justice, our conversation would be entirely different. Yes. yes. Anyway, so I also am a believer of the arts. And when you have these difficult conversations, one way to open up those discussions is to have a reference point. So that's why I was just tickled when Christy asked me, you know, what's happening? Do you have anything going on that could possibly fit? So here we are. I'm very excited about this. What you will be seeing is uh, a virtual, I call it the virtual field trip. <laughs> will not be, you know, you won't be in a theater and we are making sure that everyone is safe during this period of the pandemic. So. I really am looking forward to your comments, your thoughts, and hope that you can use this as a way to talk to your students. I mean, they're the same age as your students, what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, keep in mind, I think um, this is our new world, right? I wish, I know, Noelle, when you planned for this, we would all be in the theater watching this. And so we can't do that. And so, the experience is not exactly the same, but I do think it's, as you said, important as we watch this to remember that we're talking about young folks. You know, there are young folks as, as young as seven involved in the Birmingham Children's yes. March, which is, you know, like the, the age of my son. I can't imagine him doing anything productive some days besides aggravate me, but that's beside the point. Um, you can tell we're remote learning in this house, um, but it's really important, I think, for our students to also see themselves in these young activists because the fight continues and yes. they have to pick up that baton and keep going. So and we're seeing that now. I mean, that's right. young people and that's right. some of the same reasons that they're out there is because it's their yep. future. That's right. And quite frankly, they don't have to worry about jobs. Yep. Uh, losing jobs or having, you know, the political ramifications that older people would have to endure. Right. Not Say like they, they won't have it, but a lot of those same elements still exist. Yeah. So we're going to get started here. And for the teachers, I want you to think about a couple of things as you watch. It's only about 40 minutes. And again, invite your family, um, you know, enjoy your dinner while you're, you watch, and then we'll have a great conversation between Noelle and Kathy Harrison, the film's director, afterwards. But, you know, as Noelle was saying, theater, drama, performance, music, literature, these are amazing entry points for hard history. It gives you a text, even if it's not written, even if it's a performance or a piece of art, it gives you a text to center a conversation around. It can be really moving. It can kind of come at you with multiple senses. And so I think these are really wonderful, meaningful, but also disarming ways to get into some of this, what we call hard history. Um, and again, as we at Carolina K K-12 always say, we have to teach the resistance all through history people have resisted oppression. It is not a story of victims. It's a story of survivors. Right. It's a story of um, kings and queens rebelling. It's a story of hope and resilience. And so we really may, need to make sure that we push that part of the story while acknowledging the truth of the horror and the injustice as well. So as you watch, I'd also like you all to kind of keep track in your mind of the various kinds of resistance that you notice, overt and subtle, and also think about what parts of this, um, if any, but are there parts you might wanna use with your own young folks this week since you have that option, maybe you wanna use the whole thing, um, just kind of start to think creatively about what you might do with what you've learned so far and in combination with this show. So. 
with that, Noel and I will take a little break and the magician behind the scenes, Paul, is going to get us queued up and show us a performance of the movement. Thank you. tell you how excited I am to share this experience with you now. Um, like I said, I saw the full performance. It was an hour and 28 minutes um, in 2019. And so Kathy Harrison is a director of program excellence with Leap in New York City. She's the playwright and composer of the movement, a musical acapella, a acapella musical. And so I'm so happy to be sharing this time with you. Kathy, are you there? Yay. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you're feeling all the energy. I am. I'm actually emotional. Whenever I see, you know, the, um, the story, I don't get a chance to like watch it, particularly with the young people in it. It really moves me every time. Yes. Well, I'm right there with you. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you was, what motivated you to create this masterpiece? Oh, yes. Well, interestingly enough, you know, I've been in the education field working with young people in the creative youth development field for years, like 15 years now. I was working in an after school program in, in New Jersey in a mentoring program and happened to be cleaning up the space, you know, of the of the schoolroom building. And um, I came across a video from teachingtolerance.org. And it was about the Children's March. And what really struck me is that I didn't know the story. That in my journey, you know, as a young person, this happened in 1963, you know, and I went through a whole educational journey and yet somehow I did not know this story. And it really, um, you know, with the theater and the work that I have been doing with young people, you know, it was always important to tell those untold stories, those unfamiliar stories, and particularly the stories that reflected who we were and who I am, right, that were missing from the curriculum. And so I was really, really compelled by the story, the story of courage, and I felt, you know, particularly working in theater, there's all the popular theater shows that we, we know that we work with, with young people that as a director you bring, you know, you have Annie, you know, you have The Wiz and The Wizard of Oz, right? And those are all the traditional ones that we absolutely make sure that our young people have access to. And for me, I was like, this is an opportunity for me to really be able to help to connect, you know, uh, the history and through, through the arts, through the arts and yeah. So that's well, you right. did it. You did it. You did it. <laughs> and so what, what I absolutely love <laughs> is that so much was told using movement, singing, and what five folding chairs, so <laughs> different places. And so what came to mind for me was um, step, the art form of step. Yes, ma'am. And so I was curious as to, you know, the choices that you made to illustrate the narratives from each of the actors. Yes, well, you, it's, I'm glad that you noticed the step. Step isn't just about the rhythm, the rhythm of, you know, when you're thinking about marching and just the fact of rhythm, that's a big part of my, my journey. I'm originally from uh, Detroit, Michigan. And, um, you know, I was a part of a step team for, for years and, and also, you know, choreographed step. And in my teaching artist life, step was, you know, one of the, the art forms that I would teach. And when I was, you know, researching a story, because it took a lot of research, one of the things that really struck me was the use of music and rhythm as a way to unify and to connect, which is sort of like the basis and the foundation of what STEP is. STEP is about, you know, syncopation. It's about coming together and, you know, creating one sound. And, you know, so I felt that symbolically it also um, made sense for the project, right? Um, and just, I think the, the narrative, though my cast <laughs> might have a different sentiment because they're not necessarily steppers. It's a very um, exhausting piece you know, to, to do using that, but it also, it, 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 it brings them together, yeah. And it kept everybody so tight. So I do have to admit, even <laughs> though I was sitting in my seat the whole time, I was tired. <laughs> I was so right. And I was moving the whole time. 
Yes, it's, it's interesting because it's not something that was intentional at the time. Uh, when the movement was originated, it actually started as a 15 minute piece for a college, just like an excerpt. And the response that we received from it, I said, you know, let me develop it a little bit further. And so then it grew into a 35 minute piece, you know, so it started in 2009 at Essex County College in Newark, New Jersey, you know, through their evening college program. And then it just over the course of the next 10 years um, developed into a 60 minute work. And then through the connection with LEAP was birthed into the full final like one hour, you know, you know, 45 minute version, but we have our school version, which is the 30 or 45 minute version. So it grew, it just kept evolving as we, um, you know, did the research around it and did workshops with it. So it wasn't just a matter of uh, the script and handing it to young people. It was actually devising workshops that they actually were, went through, you know, um, where they learned the history. And then there was the performative aspect that was merged with it, the integration of the arts. Well, I'm really happy to hear that because as you heard earlier, we want to make sure that we provide opportunities for people to um, open up to have these discussions and arts the arts is so powerful to have that as a platform to do so. So one of the things I wanted to ask you when as an audience member, or as a teacher or as a student, mm -hmm. what are some of the three things that you want people to walk away from when they see this performance? One of the main things that I think that's important is about young people and their involvement, you know, in, in change and resistance as you know I love the way that it was stated this evening um, and how um, it was that was one of the things the fact that young people were significantly involved in that process and in fact that they um, helped to catapult you know the civil rights movement back to the forefront at a time when it was actually you know sort of I hate to use the word flatlining but it wasn't as you know sparked it was beginning to sort of fall backwards and the young people really stepped forward but I also want for people to recognize one of the things that really resonated with me is that it was strategic, right? Oftentimes we associate marching, you know, and, you know, walking and marching with just, oh, let's all get out on the street and just all oh, everybody just suddenly came together and just decided on this good day to go outside and, and, and march in the name of this particular cause. When in fact, it was extremely coordinated and organized by the Southern Christian Leadership Council and, you know, and the trainings, you know, the nonviolent, you know, the tactic the tactical trainings to really prepare them to use nonviolence as a resistance tool to bring attention to, you know, the injustice, right? Which is that alone, I think was something that oftentimes people miss and don't know is something that I did not know, but in doing the research, um, you know, it was really, really mind blowing to know that it wasn't just a matter of a call, uh, a call out to say show up on this day, right? And that it was weeks of, you know, uh, of trainings and, and secretive, you know, trainings um, to prepare them. So that's a, another thing that the, the truth and history side, right? The, the, the 360 of it, which is what we like to call it in LEAP. Um, and the other thing is the, the power of the arts, right? And the magic of using the arts, you know, entertainment is all around us. It's how we engage in everything that we do in the world. In the grocery store, we hear music and we bop down the aisle, right? It's just what it is. We turn on the radio in the car, right? And uh, when we're able to use the arts in ways where we're giving historical context and when we're you know, uh, sharing about social issues and, and, and at the same time um, bringing lived experiences to the stage and the humanity side of the world. And that's so important. I really believe that arts is an amazing way, uh, particularly to connect young people and the young and the old, you yeah. know, to the stories that are often untold or that we were just uh, not familiar with. That's excellent. So I am seeing some questions coming up. So I think I'm going to go ahead and read a couple of them that I feel tie right into what we're talking about right now. Uh, the first one is from Jennifer. I saw self-purification represented in the simulation scene. How might educators use a similar idea to prepare students for nonviolent activism today's socio-political climate? 
Well, that's part of what we do in our arts programming. Um, I think it's wonderful to be able to use the arts and to use script and to use improvisation, you know, when it's appropriately guided to have young people step into the shoes of, right? Or to step into a time period. But again, doing so in a way where it's, you know, facilitated and guided to where, because it can be an extremely, uh, if, if, if not, um, position with the research, if not position with, you know, understanding what that journey is, it could, it could go in the other direction as well. So definitely making sure I would say the educator should go through the process first, yeah. right? And then turn key what that experience is yourself and bring it into the classroom. But and anytime you can, can do that, and right? And be comfortable talking about how difficult this period of time was and really still is in some ways. I mean, when we're talking about the fear of death is really what we're talking about. Um, and so to be able to have that discussion about what was put in place to create that fear mm. is something I think we all need to be reminded of because right. when we have fear, we can't come from a place of love mm. and you can't connect. Right. And so, um, I wish I could say I came up with that on my own right at this moment. <laughs> a chance to see and to view the Children's March, the right. documentary film. Yep. And, and I referred to one of your lesson plans mm -hmm. that Teaching Tolerance provided. And one of the things that they highlighted was reminding us that you know, when the government, the police and the government realized that they had lost that form of control, that that's when we came into ourselves in terms of understanding the grace of power is present when we discover our own power and then exercise it. Right. And the second one, power to rebel, expression of feeling that comes when we name those injustices and sufferings that are not to be tolerated. And then the power to resist. Resistance is a refusal to accept the way things are because they can be different. And then the last point, the power to rebel and the power to resist must always be present with the power of love. Mm. If the end is not love, we revert back to negative construct of power. We revert back to being the oppressors. Mm -hmm. That's where the love came from. That's beautiful. That's that's interesting. Uh, one of the scenes in the movement that we don't see in yes. the, the condensed version is the scene where the young people, they didn't just readily step into that space of nonviolence, right? And the idea that someone would attack you and you couldn't attack them back. So that was part of what those workshops were. And one of the songs in the, the movement is what is the way, you know, what is the answer? And the answer is love. What they had to train them towards is to understand that it was not about the person right? That the actions were the thing that they were focused on, but to remember that it's the action and not the person. But yeah, that is one of the, the, the theme songs that comes from that training. You know, what is the way, you know, the way is love. Yeah. It is. And so you wrote all the, you composed all the music as well. I did. I did compose all of the original music. And as you can see, also integrated the historical sounds that come from the faith-based community, you know, those churches, which is another part of the story that's so critical and vital that uh, the faith-based, the Black churches were there, right? And a big part of, of how uh, the movement uh, was able to, 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 to get off the ground. But yes, created all of the, the music and directed and wrote the piece as well as choreographed the work. Um, you know, I have a background in all of that. I'm a performer, you know, I was a multidisciplinary artist myself. I yeah, I saw you in it, matter of fact. Uh, yes, that's the one. Actually, this was one of the first times that I was not in it. I was actually, uh, you know, also working the lights on that good day. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you. We do what we have to do. Yes, and I love every moment of it. But you see, you saw me in it at the National Black Theater Festival. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. I have another question here. I teach students who speak English as a second language. Mm -hmm. At my present school, most of these students are from the Latinx community. Mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions about how to make the history of African Americans in the United States culturally relevant to my students? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. That's a big part, again, of what um, 
we do in LEAP, and I believe that's important, that happens across you know, the education spectrum in general. Um, when it comes to, that's our community, we serve black and brown young people. A big part of our population is the Latinx community, right? And um, one of the things that we do, telling the African-American you know, story, you know, is American history. Like the same way that, you know, the way that I, you know, would associate it is the same way you learn about Benjamin Franklin and the same way, right? You learn about everything else in American history. It's interesting when it comes time to tell a story of a particular racial group or an immigrant group or whatever, we feel we have to approach it differently. The same way that we approach telling all the other stories that are living within that history book and the framing of that is this is American history, right? This is American history. And in terms of connecting it to the population that it is that you're working with, the wonderful side of it is being able to bring in to the conversation around the Chicano movement, being able to bring in and associate the Puerto Rican, you know, the, the rebellion, the other movements that have happened that are reflective of the community that you're working with then connecting it, you know, and creating those sort of like those through those through lines. But uh, I always, you know, the reality of the matter is, you know, this particular story is American history It's not just exclusive, you know, African American, there were all racial, you know, groups and dynamics that work towards, you know, this particular, um, that were involved in this story, you know? Um, so that's one of the ways that I would, I would say, you know, to, well, it, it is important that we always connect it to who they are. And I think one of the main things is they're kids that are they're dealing with some, you know, some circumstances that were, you know, traumatic, you know, and had adults that were mentors who, who helped them to step into their power. I've, I've always been curious as the aftermath of being involved in these resistant movements. Um, you know, now we use the words post-traumatic stress. Yes. And I think now as a community, we're talking more about how that really does impact us. Right. You know, I, I've, yes. and I saw it the first time and I said, oh my God, yes, the kids were at the forefront. I understand why. Yeah. But having that decision made, you know, originally, my understanding is Dr. King didn't want to have that happen. No, he didn't. Right. James Bevel, you know, who had been working with the young people and Dorothy Cotton, you know, who had um, already been working with the young people uh, when, you know, connecting it to history. The letter from Birmingham was written because the adults did not show up. The plan was that the adults in Birmingham would be the ones that would move that um, that initiative forward, that plan forward. And when they didn't show up and he got arrested and he wrote that letter and everyone said, now is not the time. You know, we should probably pause this, wait till it's a better time. You know, the religious community, you know, sent them a letter said we should hold off. And he said, no, now is the time, you know, which is why you're here to the show, do something right now. Like the time is now. And James Bevel said, listen, I've been doing these workshops with young people because, you know, they were, you know, um, working with them to help them process what was happening in their community. Um, and, you know, he said, give me this opportunity to, to, to use them. And he did not want to, which is why for years it was not on the timeline, you know, of the civil rights journey. In fact, they kept it off of there, you know, because it looked as though they had placed innocent children on the front lines and put them in danger intentionally. Right, and so they at one point weren't proud of it, right? Um, but yeah, so. Well, it did give me pause. I have to admit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but you know, how can I say? Thinking about the young people now, even um, and connecting it to today, um, which is something like in 2015, this work became popular again in terms of like people really wanting to see the movement when you know Trayvon Martin and you know right and and young people become outraged because it's young people that is happening too. That's right. Right? So this notion or this idea, they are going through that experience the same way an adult is, right? So in Birmingham, when they were bombing, you know, they called it Birmingham. They were living in that, like that, it, it, they were living through that experience. They were, they were a part of it. They weren't necessarily off and away while war was taking place. They were living in the midst of that. So it would, it would behoove them, you know what I'm saying, to be able to, I can't imagine it happening around me and I just sit there and I'm 14 and I'm 15. That's the time when you itching to really be able to have your voice be heard and you're stepping into your, you know, your young adult self. And so um, I think where it probably felt 
um, you know, a little tricky is the fact that adults didn't leave them to their own devices and say, you know, and let them handle it in their own way because that's what it could have turned into, right? It, it's no way that it wouldn't have with what was taking place. Instead, it was guided. It was a guided. So there's a part that then you have to say, well, wait a minute. You know, they could have just allowed, uh, not been a part of saying this is the way that we can approach this and teach them about the strategy to really be able to bring attention to it to create that change. Um, and that's why people are now, like Black Lives Matter, violence and all this kind of stuff. No, it's not. What it is, is oftentimes the guidance factor you know, because adults stepped back, but they had adults that stepped forward with them and walked them through that journey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we also have to celebrate that. Now is the amazing Sarah Carrier to show us some of the resources. We don't want you to leave. In addition to all that stuff we've been putting into the chat box, we also want to show you this kind of groundbreaking on the books website, as well as all the lesson plans that are there for you, ready to go to teach about Jim Crow using the site or not using the site. You have lots of options here. So, um, I'm gonna introduce Sarah Carrier, who has joined me on screen. She is the content expert and outreach for On the Books at UNC Libraries, which she's gonna give you an overview of this really special work. Sarah is a research and instruction librarian at Wilson Special Collections. Um, and she supports research related to the history, people, and culture of North Carolina. Her work emphasizes the centrality of archives and special collections to inform the present while building historical consciousness. And in her role with the groundbreaking project and website on the books, she provides collections and primary source expertise, as well as strategizes outreach and support for potential users of the website. She is truly always willing to help a teacher so you guys should know when you're looking for a particular type of North Carolina history source, she's somebody, if you email her, she actually does get back to you from the university. So she gets extra credit for that. Um, and somehow she's finding time to complete a PhD in the American Studies Department at UNC Chapel Hill right now with a young baby. I have no idea how she's doing all of that other than that she's a superwoman. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to give us a kind of whirlwind look at this site and the resources available to you. Hey there, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. And I will um, try to um, uh, cover as much information as possible, but um, with uh, time in mind. Um, if you all have any questions, I'm wondering, um, go ahead and throw them in the chat, but um, just for the sake of getting everyone to dinner and, and their families, um, what I'll probably do too is um, collect some links and information to share with you and I'll take your questions um, uh, in uh, a later time and in, in an asynchronous <laughs> fashion. Um, and I'm happy to email with you or talk with you on the phone. Um, so I'm gonna um, go ahead and share my screen without further ado. Um, as Christy was, was saying, um, I work at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm a librarian, but I am going to be presenting information about this project, which I really hope is going to be very useful for you. So let me actually um, start the uh, slideshow here. Hold on one second. I'm trying to get to, hold on. I thought that I had already started it. Here we go. And, aha. So um, let me, Tell you a little bit about the project. So I am um, one of the team members and I'm going to spend the first part of this, um, this little presentation just giving you an overview of the, um, of the project itself. Um, and then what I'm going to be doing is um, showing you the actual site. So when I get to that point, it would be great um, if you um, are able to pull up the browser and go ahead and bookmark the site, you can follow along um, and, and keep um, all of that for your record. So this slide is just to show you how large the project has, has become. Um, and we are partnering with Carolina K-12 as well. Um, uh, the people listed here are um, people who work for UNC Libraries um, by, um, by large, um, <laughs> speaking as a, 
as part of this large group. And so we have programmers, we have historians, we have librarians, and it's, it's a very large interdisciplinary group. So let me tell you a little bit about our funding. <laughs> so we are a grant funded project. So this is not a project that's going to last forever. Um, but the work that we're doing to um, help you with your teaching of Jim Crow in North Carolina, that history and that impact um, is something that we want to continue beyond um, the grant that we received to actually try and look at this massive corpus of laws passed by the General Assembly of North Carolina during the Jim Crow era um, and all of this race-based legislation. So we received, um, applied for and received a couple um, pretty great grants. And this is really what we've been trying to do. So we wanted to make this part of the legal history in North Carolina um, as accessible as possible. Um, so make it available as a single text corpus. And so what we're dealing with are over 100 years of public, private, and local session laws. And some of that distinction, um, I'll show you on the website, um, it does have meaning. So. It, it has meaning as far as how, um, how people are impacted by the particular law that's being passed. Um, and so we have lots of different kinds of laws um, represented here, but these are all laws passed by at the state level, um, even if they are local laws. And so, you know, of course we're talking about Jim Crow. So we started thinking, okay, we're, we're doing end of reconstruction through the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and, and we started looking at it and, and we started seeing, of course, race-based legislation was, um, was appearing um, understandably well before the end of reconstruction. Um, and we wanted to go deeper into the 1960s as well. So we ended up having a very large corpus of, of laws. Um, but what I'm going to tell you next is um, the reason why we ended up um, looking for this grant and putting together this huge team of people is um, I tried to do this by myself <laughs> um, by looking at the actual books and flipping through them and searching through the PDFs. And it was a, um, a massive undertaking to say the least. Um, so could we actually do this in a more automated fashion? Um, and do um, what we call text analysis to see if there's a way for, um, to generate an inventory of Jim Crow laws in North Carolina, um, at least as, a, as something to start with um, and do it in a much more automated fashion. And so um, I know that you all are going to be talking about Polly Murray um, and, and, and maybe you have been, um, I think that Christy was going to close with some, um, some of Polly Murray's words, but she and her work are both um, informing what we do and, and um, she, her life and her work um, serve as inspiration for what we're doing. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, um, so if you haven't heard of Polly Murray, um, a lawyer, priest, poet, activist, and um, she did conduct this research manually um, by sitting down with the books. Um, so all of the laws published in volumes um, generated by the General Assembly um, during their sessions and looked through and published states laws on race and color. And, and it wasn't just North Carolina. She looked across the entire South um, looking for these Jim Crow laws. And so we were able to start with that um, and her work goes up through 1955. Um, and we wanted to see if we could um, duplicate that work, but also add to it um, and, and do so in an automated fashion, like I said, because her work um, did take quite a, a, a long amount of time. Um, and she also has a, um, a very important connection to UNC Chapel Hill, which is part of the significance of why we're doing this at UNC. Um, so um, she was first denied um, uh, entry to graduate school at UNC in 1938. That year, both she and another black woman, um, a woman by the name of Edwina Thomas, they both applied um, at a couple different points in 1938 to the graduate school. And this is based on um, uh, a, a number of cases that had been moving through um, different states um, challenging 
segregation in higher education. And so she was denied entry to graduate school in 1938. Um, we have records of her correspondence with the then president of UNC, um, uh, Frank Porter Graham. She also applied to law school in 1951. Um, she already had her law degree, but was hoping to take additional coursework. And she was again denied. Um, she also has a, a very important and deep family connection to UNC Chapel Hill, and that is through the Smith family. So Mary Ruffin Smith was a major landowner and um, benefactor uh, to the university. Um, if you know Chapel Hill or Orange County, we're talking about Farrington Village, what's now Farrington Village and Smith Level Road. So they were um, major landowners and enslavers, um, the Smith family. And so Mary Ruffin Smith had um, two brothers, Francis and Sidney, and both of these men um, uh, forced themselves um, upon one of the women that the family enslaved. Um, and that woman's name was Harriet. And she um, bore to both of them uh, children. And um, one of those children um, born to Harriet and Sydney was Cornelia Smith, um, who was Polly Murray's grandmother. So what I have here is um, um, just one of her poems. Um, she was a prolific writer. Um, and this is from a book in Wilson Library. So um, I thought that this poem was especially powerful. And she had actually donated the book, <laughs> this collection of poems to UNC. Um, so this connection was very much a part of her thinking and her way of working. Um, and uh, she, she knew about this relationship and continually put pressure on the university her entire life um, and, and resisted um, the exclusion um, and the violence of, of that exclusion. So you can see that the inscription, she says that I am a great, great niece of Mary Ruffin Smith um, and granddaughter of Cornelia Smith Fitzgerald. So um, I thought that that was very important to share. Um, we have, a lot of content available through our website that we hope will help you not only access the inventory of Jim Crow laws that we have generated um, through this um, computational work, but also um, uh, lots of other educational and curriculum related um, content as well. So this is just to say on our website, you're gonna see a lot of other stuff, including the entire text corpus of a hundred years of information. Um, and then also um, um, uh, information about how to actually replicate this for those kind of computational uh, text analysis, digital humanities folks who want to try and do something very similar. Um, we have partnered with Carolina K-12 um, and the North Carol Carolina Society to build um, this in engagement, build this um, teaching module focused on K-12 teaching. And I wanted to say that the whole project actually came from, um, came from a social studies teacher who contacted me. Um, I do um, reference and instruction work looking at North Carolina. And um, I, I work with a lot of, um, of teachers and educators and um, all kinds of folks doing lots of different things, but he um, was teaching and wanted to teach Jim Crow. And he asked me, is there an inventory? Um, is there a list somewhere of all of the Jim Crow laws passed in North Carolina? And I said, no. Um, and so I ended up going to our collections because I knew that we had the books. Um, so every session um, where the General Assembly met and passed laws, um, there would be a volume um, published. And so we had those physical volumes and I knew that they had been scanned. Um, so we have the PDFs available. But what we're talking about is um, 96 volumes and over 80,000 individual images or pages. Um, so this is a massive um, undertaking. And I wanted to just really quickly show you um, what one of the volumes looks like. Um, and you'll have this link um, and you can also see this through, um, through the website. But what we're having, what we're looking at here is this is public local laws of, of 1911 and it's 1,322 pages. Okay, so this is just one session. 
and it, it just sort of looks like this. <laughs> Um, there is an index, but it has no use, usefulness <laughs> whatsoever, I can assure you, especially if you're looking for um, uh, race, racial language, um, uh, information related to race. So um, <laughs> yeah, so an interesting um, challenge here that um, forced me to uh, think outside of the box. And so I approached my colleagues and we also had some challenges trying to actually wrangle all of these scans into something we could use. Um, and that took quite a long time, actually. That ended up being um, a lot of the time. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is just showing you how when you start looking at the laws, sometimes there are misspellings. And that's because of the way that the, that the, the, the best that the algorithm that the computer could do um, to try and parse some of the characters or try to read some of, you know, maybe the printing error, errors or other things like that. But this is just to kind of give you kind of a peek under the hood. Um, so again, just getting back to what we were trying to do with the project, create the corpus and just make it available for all kinds of um, scholarly work, um, historical work. There's so much that can be done um, with, with these laws, with this legal um, information. And then can we automatically, or to um, somewhat of an approximation, automatically determine which laws are Jim Crow? So what we ended up doing was kind of a combination of things, okay? Um, so we have an algorithm, okay? We need for it to figure out what is a Jim Crow law, what isn't a Jim Crow law, but then we have all of these experts, um, some of them, um, including Polly Murray and Richard Pascal, um, uh, did uh, an amazing amount of work um, uh, definitively saying these are Jim Crow laws. So we can use that to train our computer <laughs> to, to properly say, oh, okay, I'm comparing these things and, and this is a definitive yes or no. And then we also had two other people on the team, historian uh, William Sturkey and, um, postdoc um, from American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, Kimber Thomas. So there, you know, there are some things that we're hoping to improve upon, some things that may continue to be limitations. Um, if you read William Sturkey's essay, um, you know that sometimes um, it, it's not explicit in the law that it is Jim Crow, um, it, that is race-based legislation, but it is in its um, impact and its implementation that it is um, discriminatory, okay? And then we have some other things, you know, as far as, you know, interpretation of what is and what isn't Jim Crow. Um, so I just wanted to quickly say too, um, we call this on the books, algorithms of resistance. And this also kind of, that in, in a very important way comes back to Polly Murray and the origins of this, which is based in um, teaching the young people of this country, um, the young North Carolinians about their history um, because it's real and it's still happening. Um, and so we take um, some inspiration too from Sophia Noble who wrote a really important book, Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and she was looking at Google um, to prove that, you know, these computers are not just, you know, um, completely neutral, unbiased. They aren't just, um, you know, they're, you know, uninfluenced, right, by um, any kind of um, human um, uh, position or, po or politics. So data discrimination is real. The internet is biased <laughs> and um, computers and, and their programs are not neutral. Um, but that's not the end of the story. Um, we're trying to turn that around and, and we're trying to make visible um, all of this history and, and information and all this language um, that has been intentionally obscured or at least um, if not obscured, um, sort of cloaked um, and maybe in a way by white supremacy. Um, can we use a tool of the oppressor, a tool of oppression against itself? Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why this is so important for our time now, too, is that many Jim Crow laws are still on the books. Um, and in our, in our state constitution, there's still a literacy um, requirement um, for voting um, in our state constitution. And um, 
it is just a question of whether or not um, it's enforceable um, because of uh, civil rights legislation like the Civil Rights Act and um, Fair Housing Act. Um, and also whether or not um, the powers that be choose to enforce it. Um, so this is um, just an overview of the project. I wanted to kind of give you um, uh, some context for what we have been talking about here. Um, so I'm also just gonna kind of briefly go through the website. Um, this is something that you'll be able to um, interact with in your, um, I, I was gonna say spare time, but who has spare time? <laughs> um, but I'm here if you have any, um, if you want to go to particular places within the site or see um, particular um, aspects that would be directly useful for your teaching. Um, so there are two parts of the website that I want to um, point out to you because I think that they would be the most useful, the most applicable. So one is um, the list of Jim Crow laws. Okay, so they're under, it's under laws, Jim Crow laws. Um, and it tells you a little bit about how the laws were, um, were actually identified. Um, and the list shows up here. And I would just recommend just searching by keyword. Okay, so if you put um, Indian into it, and of course you have to also think about the language um, that would have been used um, for a lot of these, um, I would say, I mean, definitely way into the 20th century, um, the word Negro was not used, rather colored was used. Um, before um, the Lumbee um, were officially recognized as Lumbee, they were called um, the Croatan. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot going on there. So um, some of this you have to kind of play with a little bit, but just as an example, um, you know, these are, this session information is gonna limit it to a particular year. Um, this is going to be um, what type of law it is. And I think that it's most useful to just kind of get an idea of what's going on here, um, which is, you know, here is about schooling. So let's just look at this. We're gonna view the law and it tells you where it came from and, and what year, so that's very useful. Um, and then an act to change the name of the Indians in Robinson County. So this is part of a larger um, uh, act um, or set of laws, um, which they designate as a chapter. But this is, um, you know, looking at um, the Croatan Indian Normal School, um, changing their name to the Indian Normal School. Um, and there's a lot of really fascinating um, work to be done um, looking at these laws as far as um, native and indigenous um, uh, populations impacted by Jim Crow. Um, and so if you put in Robison, you can put in the name of a county and see um, what laws come up. Um, and you can see here, um, again, this is just, you know, an example of where the computer was a little bit confused about whether that was an L or a, an exclamation mark. Um, but, you know, this is really powerful. Um, 1911, they were really doing a lot, right? And I think looking at the temporal information too is really powerful um, and asking your students to think about that, like what was happening in 1911. Um, but here you have, this is the Indian Normal School of Robison. They have the power to employ and discharge teachers to prevent Negroes from attending said school. Okay, so you have um, some really um, uh, disturbing um, impacts um, happening here. So this is where you have um, the list of North Carolina Jim Crow laws, which is searchable. You can also view the original PDF or just the image of the page. So this could be interesting too. Um, so you can see what the context was um, of that particular law as well. So that's what these lists do. And this tells you who or how it was identified. And we had one of our experts, so a human, <laughs> um, identify this and, and um, confirm that it was Jim Crow. The other area that I wanted to really quickly tell you about is the teach section. So here we have um, links to all of the amazing curriculum modules and guides and lesson plans put together by Carolina K-12. Um, the default for this is WordPress, it's all in alphabetical order, um, but um, I'm not sure how much we can do to 
change that, but you're going to see that alphabetical order is kind of the um, the uh, the order of the day. <laughs> and if you go here, there are three other um, components that I, I hope will be useful for you, and we would love for you to give us feedback too. Um, part of the inspiration for this um, partially came from the 1619 Project um, website as well. So, um, you know, we wanted to have a glossary um, and we would love to know if this is helpful or if, you, if more concepts or terms need to be added. Um, and we have a timeline. Now, um, I'm going to be continuing to add images um, to this timeline, um, but you can see we have a, a number of points and you can navigate through this chronologically. And I've tried to add um, images and I'm still working on this with links. Um, so if you have um, an image um, here, you could even open it in a new tab. Um, let me see here, where did it go? Here we go, um, where you can download it, um, but you have the, the citation. Um, so I'm trying to put primary sources all over the place <laughs> so that you can easily grab some things. Um, for example, for the Emancipation Proclamation, um, I put a clipping from a North Carolina newspaper, um, which again, you can, if there isn't a link, um, the links are usually for those things where um, we have it in the collection at Wilson Library. Um, so this would be a link to um, this material that we actually hold in the library that can be downloaded um, uh, right from our websites, okay? So we have our timeline. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to show you is um, this list of primary and secondary sources, which is growing. Um, you can limit it, which I would recommend doing since um, it's alphabetical. Um, you can limit it by primary and secondary. Um, or you can, we're trying to really expand this. Um, I want to add oral um, histories to this as a category, um, but you can limit it by, um, by genre, essentially, or resource type. So um, for example, um, autobiographies, we have one right now, which is um, a very short piece by Zora Neale Hurston about an experience that she had um, visiting a doctor um, in New York. Um, and this is, um, a, a very disturbing um, uh, experience that she had with a white doctor. Um, and so I have tried to link directly to um, a, a place where you can interact with these things um, or download them. Um, some of them are links to particular documents, but some of them may also be um, a collection that I think um, is especially useful. So for example, UNC Greensboro, they have um, uh, a whole website um, of Greensboro-centric um, civil rights primary sources, um, including essays, okay? So you can um, interact with this. They have lesson plans as well. You can see State Library, all of our friends involved <laughs> um, with this. So um, this is something that um, we hope is really interesting to you and useful. Um, wanted to just point out really fast too, that when we have secondary sources, so this would be scholarly work interpretation, um, what I've done is I've linked to WorldCat so that if you have, want to use this book or check it out, um, it recognizes your zip code and it will tell you, it will list exactly where, um, where the, the closest library is that has this book. Um, and so you can see that I'm in Durham. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully that is help, helpful to you. And if you're looking for primary sources, I would recommend going to that. Um, and if you're looking for anything in particular that's missing um, or that um, is especially compelling that you um, would like to see, please do let me know. Um, the only other thing that I would say just really quickly is, um, I'm just trying to, handle my screens here. Um, one thing that um, I was thinking about as far as how to how to find primary sources related to um, this particular topic of Jim Crow in North Carolina and and also what to use, um, especially considering um, the possibility of trauma um, and harm um, to our students, um, considering the subject matter and particularly our um, are young students of color um, who are um, 
I mean, I work at UNC Chapel Hill and I work with undergraduates um, and um, there's a lot going on at the institution that um, uh, imparts uh, extra harm um, to their experience of being just on campus. Um, and with the pandemic going on, um, this is all exacerbated. So, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, we want to mitigate trauma and harm. So, um, you know, look, trying to find primary sources and what I've tried to put into these lists um, are, are th this is very carefully thought out. Um, you know, I may not be right about everything, or maybe even um, maybe conservative or more conservative than others. But um, like for example, we I teach classes about lynching um, in in North Carolina and the South, and um, uh, there is a lot of material that I do not show the students because. I don't have to, like we have postcards um, and um, we really need to ask ourselves, do we need, do we need to show this? Um, do, what, what do we want for the students to learn? Um, and you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, this is something that is really um, thought about a lot um, within um, librarianship particularly for us as teaching librarians, people like myself, because um, I heard um, at a conference um, an archivist saying, you know, the, this is a very, um, this is a, a big statement, but that the, that the institution or the university um, is the murder weapon um, and the archives wipe the murder weapon clean. Um, so what we are guilty of, um, we are guilty of many things, um, but the the libraries, the archives, um, have conventionally conventionally silenced um, voices, um, silenced experiences, um, squelched um, stories of empowerment um, and resistance. And so, what we're trying to do is push back against that. Um, and so, um, you know, we're just thinking a lot about this, of course. Um, the, the thing is, is if you just sort of go into the wild looking for primary sources, I, I pulled this up because, I, and I'm not trying to say anything about the Library of Congress because we work the exact same way. This is not to, <laughs> I could pull up many things in our collections, but I was looking for photographs that we don't have. We don't have a lot of photographs um, or documentary um, uh, information resources about the Lumbee. And so I was looking in the Library of Congress online and their print and photographs catalog for, um, I knew that Marion, um, she worked the farms for the Farm Security Administration and she did documentary work. Now, what you have here is very conventional archival practice, which is to just take whatever the creator here, in this case, the photographer, used to describe their their material and just re just type it out just keep that um and so you know i am disturbed by this um you know i there's a lot to think it through as far as you know of course like we may want to use these photographs um but i would um, do a lot of thinking about whether or not I would, um, unless we are teaching something about the archives um, or something like that, like it, exposing people to that kind of language is uh, traumatizing. Um, and we see um, that experience of, of shock and dismay and sadness. And so, um, so again, not to point that out as um, something to um, disparage the Library of Congress for necessarily because unfortunately it is very common in the field. Um, and, you know, another thing is, um, you know, if you, this is actually a portal into our own collections at UNC, um, you know, if you are just looking for photographs of the Klan, um, well, we have, we have a fair number um, digitized. And, you know, even looking at some of these photos, um, I, I, I would just recommend, um, I don't know, I, 
not that you shouldn't show it, but the way that you scaffold that experience through the careful choices um, and, and making space for the students to be able to work through um, their intellectual and, and affective experiences. Um, and, you know, these images need to be face down. Um, these, this um, documentation of white supremacy and violence, um, it, it needs to be faced. Um, but what we also want to do is center stories of resistance and survival um, as well. And I just wanted to share really quickly a, a tactic that I use. Um, I'm, I'm teaching, um, I link this in the primary sources, but we have the diary of the first black woman undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, her name is Karen Parker. She lives in Greensboro now. And um, we're going to be mapping um, the, her diary of um, uh, her junior and senior year at UNC Chapel Hill where she experienced um, an, an, an unbelievable um, amount of uh, uh, isolation and um, um, direct violence from her participation in civil rights um, protests in Chapel Hill. Um, and so I'm putting together some resources for these students um, and I am putting some um, content warnings um, onto some of the folders, um, you know, so that before they click into it and see it that they are um, prepared. Um, but again, um, not um, emphasizing or choosing the things that are um, especially traumatizing. Um, I do have a video of um, a Klan rally that was held um, just down uh, basically where um, food line, there's like Eastgate um, Shopping Center, if you know Chapel Hill, that at the time was outside of town. Um, and that's where the Klan rally was in March of 64. And when I talk to students at UNC about this, it, it is like shocking. Um, it, it's always shocking to me to think about it, but you know, Chapel Hill in particular has this kind of um, uh, aura about it, that it is the light on the hill, that it is a refuge for you know, liberal thinking, um, that it's where, you know, uh, that's not the site of racial violence. Um, so there's this disconnect and this discord happening. Um, and, and as students are working through it, we just try to scaffold it as much as possible. Um, so this is just to say, your students are definitely going to be encountering um, some, some possibly disturbing um, language and information here. Um, and I didn't put a, a, like a content warning on every single thing. Um, so I would just, um, just kind of scroll through first. Um, and I'm also trying to add to some of the maybe more unique genres. Um, so um, here's a song by Eric Dolphy, um, a composition um, called Jim Crow. That's um, really beautiful. And so I'm trying to kind of think of other kinds of experiences that students may find useful. So I'm going to stop now and I apologize. Um, I think that I did um, plan for a bit longer of a, um, I'm actually trying to stop. No worries. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, um, we were running late. Like I said, it's, it's every teacher runs late. And so I do want to say to everyone that's still with us, we are going to up your CEUs, Paul, we're going to give them four hours of CEU because even though we're leaving now, um, because you guys stayed with us, almost 200 of you are still with us. Why are you still with us? I love that you're still with us. Um, so Sarah, thank you so much. Um, Susan did ask one of our teachers, can you make available all of the web links that you showed? I know you're usually so great and you'll send me a list of those and then we can send it to the teachers. Great. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, we're hoping that this will be, you know, kind of a portal into um, scholarly work and thinking and teaching about Jim Crow in North Carolina, but we aren't going to be able to link to everything right. um, or represent everything. So um, yeah, if it's going to be growing and happy to um, try to put together a list of things. It's it's hard to, um, yeah, go to an archive and, and you wouldn't be able to search for Jim Crow. Um, you know, you could sometimes search for protests or sit in or, or, or segregation. Um, but yeah, it's, it can be tricky. And so I'm trying to, you know, kind of 
raise up, uh, make more visible some of those things for you all. So, and again, you guys, I meant it when I said it, I put Sarah, Sarah's email address in there. She is so great. If you email her and you were looking for something, she is magic. She will make it happen. So take her up on that. And I also really appreciate Sarah, the attention that you gave to, um, really choosing primary sources carefully. And one of the things that Carolina K-12 recommends is that you kind of follow the same guidelines that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum puts out about teaching about the Holocaust. It's very relevant to teaching about slavery and Jim Crow and being very kind of mindful about not triggering and traumatizing students. And part of that is also always pairing it with a resistance like we were talking about. So, um, but with that, it is late and I love you guys and I want you to go have some rest and watch some bad TV and not think about students or any of this stuff for a little bit. So we're gonna say good night here. I do wanna again say thank you so much to Richard Pascal, to Noelle James and Kathy Harrison, to the performers and the movement, um, to Sarah Carrier, to Paul Benici behind the scenes, to our partners at the North Carolina History Museum. Special thanks to the Breitmayer Foundation and to the North Carolina Society for making this book possible and for sending um, all of you a copy of a book of your choice. Paul has popped into the chat box the link where you can fill out your quick questions and ask for that book. Um, and so please try to do that. Um, if we run out of books, it would be first come first serve. So do that sooner than later, but we're gonna try to take care of all of you because we just love teachers. Tomorrow, again, we're gonna follow up with an email um, giving you all this stuff. A recording of everything tonight, except for the performance will be on our YouTube channel, which that link was shared and will come to you tomorrow. And we put in the chat box and it will come to you tomorrow, your own special link for viewing the movement with your students if you um, choose to do that and excerpt the whole thing, whatever you might want to do. And again, the deepest gratitude, the absolute most deepest gratitude goes to each of you who have dedicated yourselves to teaching our state's young folks and are specifically courageous enough to teach a full and comprehensive history of our nation's hard history, our shared past collectively. You know, when we all tell the truth about it, that's how we're going to not repeat it. So you play such a critical role, it can't be overstated in breaking the cycle that pushes us through to truth and reparation and reconciliation. And so please remember your power for that. And so as we exit tonight, I'm gonna end things, um, but I'm just gonna play us out. If you wanna you know, scroll back through the chat and collect any of those web addresses, although we are gonna send those to you too, or start working on your um, evaluation form and book request there now. I wanna close us with the words of the incredible Polly Murray. And again, we put a, um, a link for a lesson plan of this Durham, North Carolina history extraordinaire. So please do know that it's, she, you must tell your students about her. You must know about her, she's incredible. But Sarah spoke a bit about her, um, you know, Reverend Murray was a gifted black scholar and an activist who grew up in Durham, North Carolina during the Jim Crow era, as we mentioned in 1940, um, well, rather in 1940, she was actually arrested for um, sitting in the white section of a bus. So 15 years before the famous arrest of Rosa Parks. And in 1950, as we mentioned earlier, she as an attorney published a collection of race-based laws across the US, an incredible amount of research and work and risk, frankly, to do this work. Um, this is only a small part of her many accomplishments. And so I'm gonna leave you listening to a three minute oral history interview that Reverend Murray did in the seventies in which she imparts a really important and relevant message to us for today. Um, it's about how she feels about America and it's about democracy. So if you can hang out for a few, three minutes, if you want to do listen to the words of Polly Murray. If you need to continue on with your evening, we understand. Thank you for staying. Again, we are giving you a four hour CEU with some extra padding in there just because you're awesome and we appreciate you. So with that, I'm gonna power down. I'm gonna ask Paul to play that clip, the amazing Polly Murray, and we hope to see you at another event very soon. Thank you guys for being here. You're the best. Teachers rule the world. You're the glitter and the glue. Thank you, good night. Been my attitude toward America. I, I love America. And whatever she hands me, I'm handing her back with the, uh, uh, I hope, of championship quality. 
And so, so many of my heroes, my racial heroes, have been the champions, the Jackie Robinsons, the people who climbed over and said, I'll show you. For the sake of, of all those who may in the future listen to this and not be able to understand, perhaps because of the circumstances under which they listen to it, uh, let's go into a little bit more about I Love America. You, you're saying I love America for a particular kind of reason. Um, it wasn't really America as it was actually with with the violence and uh, with all the problems in the society, all the injustices. But um, can you explain more about what it was? What do I mean by saying that I love America? First, it is home. Uh, no one can be more native to America than America's black population because America's black population biologically is of all of the great streams of mankind that make up America. The first American, the indigenous American, by this time there's been so much recirculation of genes that we're all mixed up. We all have Indian, European, and African ancestry. Secondly, traditionally, black Americans go back to the very beginnings of America. And our blood and our sweat and our tears and our memories are built into the country. And I maintain that Africa has already made her contribution to America, that America is as she is today. In many ways, culturally, uh, because of the presence of black Americans. Uh, the impact upon speech, the impact upon customs in the South. Uh, you know, America would have been a different country without the presence of the black. Yes, even though it was involuntary, the presence right. was something that right. had an indelible imprint right. upon America. Right. And of course, as you said, um, as much as we are built into it, we built it. Mm -hmm. Right. All of this, then, plus America's, her dreams. Some people might call it her pretensions. I want to see America be what she says she is. And I consider it part of my responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a kind, it's a kind of patriotism 